What's up? What's up? Ugh. Fucking tired. Fucking tired today. What's up? I think we're good now, man. Turn this down. Good. What's up, everybody? How you doing today? How's it going today? It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday, I believe. Losing track. Not really, though, because um, we're doing some shooting last night. So. I knew it had to be Monday when we were shooting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. We're here to interview Pungent Stooge. So we'll get started in a few. Let's get everybody going. Nice to see y'all again. What's up, Jake? Hope everybody's doing well. What's up, Kev? Early show today. Because we're interviewing Pungent Stench, Austria. So they're like six, seven hours ahead. So, uh, yeah, man. So this is what we're doing. It's Pungent Stench Day. It sure is. I get back in the groove again. A little bit. Literally just woke up like an hour ago. Show us your hair. <laughs> yeah, I fucking shaved my head last night. I just got... <laughs> we were shooting last night. And uh, I needed my mop. My bald mop, and then I was like, fuck it, I gotta shave my head. So I fucking shaved it. Cause I'm going bald, man, I'm fucking... I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. about the shorts short shorts man that's it it's life it's life <laughs> that's how it is <laughs> oh. that we're doing some short film stuff horror shit man we love horror I am tired but we got an interview to do doing well. Hope everybody's doing well. Oh, man. Should have made some coffee. 
<laughs> I got water. That's how it works. The old pungent stench, eh? I think I'm doing well. Just tired, like I said, man. We were shooting last night. We usually started last couple day, uh, last couple weeks. Yeah, last couple weeks we've been uh, obviously not doing the interviews. We just got some other shit we're doing. Rabbit Dog Films. We've been busy, uh, busy making this short film. Uh, which was a concept that myself, Phil Pattison, and Carlos of The Butcher Shop came up with a few years ago. It's called Wolf Juice. And it was one of those nights where we're sitting at Carlos' shop. He's Carlos' shop, as I say, is a makeup effect studio. So we were hanging out there and, uh, I'm like, well, let's just shoot some shit, right? That's some some hilarious stuff. So uh, we ended up making this Wolf Juice short film, and uh, it was pretty funny. You know, it was we all, we just won we we won it. We we're just winging it, and uh, I don't know. We were all pretty happy with it. It was just like you know, it was a, it was it was a goofy fun time. And then uh, Phil got home, and a couple days later, he calls me. He's like, Yeah, I'm. Uh, I think we're gonna have to reshoot Wolf Juice because I lost the footage. <laughs> okay, hey man, this shit happens, man. Digital age, what are you gonna do, right? So, uh, so during all this, you know, once we were allowed to have a few people hanging around and uh, do some gatherings, I was like, let's fucking just do something again, right? Like it's killing us. We're all dying to shoot something. Carlos is ready to blow up some heads. And, you know, cut some chests open and stuff. Like, let's just frickin' do something. So, uh, alright, well, let's do Wolf Juice. Let's bring him back. So, uh, we're like, alright, let's do it the next Wednesday. It was a couple weeks, few weeks ago. So, Wednesday comes up. Alright, let's do it. I don't know, how are we gonna dress? We're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. We, 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 we're winging it the whole time. Like, this whole, whatever short we shot, we, we improv this whole thing. We improv the effects, the gags. The, the dialogue, the lighting, like, there was no setup, it was just, let's do it, and we did it, and it was supposed to turn out, it was supposed to be a one-day shoot, it turned into three-day shoot, because we ended up inviting more characters, and bringing some more stuff on, and this thing is just goofy, it turned into this goofy project that took three days, ten-hour shoots, really, and uh, just because we love it. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens with it. Phil's going to start playing with it. And it's hilarious so far from what we've seen. The little edits, the rough edits. Just to get some reference. But my God, is it ever funny. It is so funny. So, yeah. So that's what's going on. Um, so, yeah. We ended, ended up getting home at like 5 a.m. this morning. And... Uh, got up to do this interview so I want to give a shout out to some Canadian friends here uh, they recently got signed to redefining darkness records our buddy Thomas out in Ohio ended up putting out uh, quite the album actually very impressed very impressed so this band, this band's called Deathrus. I'm gonna turn this down a bit. I'm gonna turn this down a bit. So this band called Deathrus. I think we can see that. 
And uh, the album's called Hack to Death. Literally so fucking good, man. And it's awesome that these Canadian guys are killing it. And that looks like uh, Carl Dahmer artwork, I do believe. Um, uh, but yeah, eight tunes. The shit rips, man. The shit rips. And uh, also sending, which uh, I believe I'm, I'm unfamiliar with, but there's a, it's a split. Animosity. And I can't even, what is that? I don't know what the other band is. Scar, uh, you're gonna have to. Oh shit. Scarly, Scarly. So it's a split. I gotta check this out. I haven't dug into uh, any of this yet. The Death of Riss, of course, I have. It's fucking great. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to dig into this stuff. And. Uh, this is killer, man. Canadian rules. So, they got some really rad stickers and shit. God damn, god damn. Totally dead. That's a great logo, though. It's <laughs> a wicked logo. Damn straight, man. Damn straight. A little poster. We got to put up some posters. Got a little, little flyers and posters and shit. It's always a, it's always a hoot, right? Right? I like posters. I like posters. And uh, I gotta say, man, it's some fucking sweet ass shirts. It's pretty fucking intense. It's pretty fucking intense. Deathrus. I love it. I fucking love it. Oh yeah, let's go in the back. It's a killer, man. Hacked to death. I have been. I have been. Deathrus, I believe. Is a Riddick? That looks like a Riddick. Some Riddick art. Skank fast. Eat ass. See? <laughs> we need some more funny sayings on the back of shirts sometimes man during these times right now it's almost like cradle of filth needs to bring back that jesus is a cunt shirt right just to fucking piss people off fuck you right <laughs> so funny and here's the fucking shirt of all shirts too it's a fucking shirt sweet ass sweet ass long sleeve Make them die slowly, Deathrus. Make them die slowly. But yeah, man. Support. Support goes out to my Canadian brothers. I believe it's uh, Calgary. I don't have the envelope. I'm sorry. Uh, but fuck. It's killer shit. I'm going to post some links. We'll post some links. Uh, after the interview, see how that, uh, so you can, uh, you know, check out, uh, check out some shit. And, uh, oh, Death the Wrist has guest appearance from Chris from Skeletal Remains. Sweet. Not sure if, uh, you're a fan of, uh, Skeletal Remains, but, uh, we are here. And we got some, uh, cheers to our Canadian brothers. You got it, Jay. Jay Longo, Blood of Christ, motherfucker. My boys from Calgary, John Duke. Damn straight. Cool, man. Uh, yeah, also, uh, I don't know anybody out there got that new Undergang. I know it's only one tune, but it's the Undergang Dead Split. I had to grab that. I'm big, I like Dead's pretty rad. From Extremely Rotten. But it's a it's a sweet fucking it's a sweet vinyl. Oh, it looks red. I haven't even, I haven't even I haven't even listened to this yet. I've been fucking busy lately. Sweet, dead undergang. Damn straight, man. So.
So we got to check that shit out. Yeah, props out to uh, Extremely Rotten. And uh, they just put out a new zine too, called the Putra Zine. It's been delayed, it's a little delay on it for a little bit, just because uh, Dave Michelson of Under Gang and Extremely Rotten is uh, he's a busy guy. But uh, fucking killer zine, man. And who doesn't like a good fucking zine? I like a good zine. I totally do. So uh, mad support, man. Mad support. It's all about helping each other out during these times. Not just during these times. All the time. So uh, let's fucking see. Uh, let's see where, uh, where Buddy Alex is. All right, let's go. Uh, I think we got to do this. I think we're just going to go right here. We'll try this out. Oh, all right. Oh, where are you? Can't see you. <laughs> Bam. Here we go. What's up, brother man? Did you call me before? No. No, no. This is it. Okay. Right on. So. I didn't, so, uh, miss. I didn't miss you. Not at all. Not at all. How are you, my friend? Very fine, thank you. Good, good. Uh, looks like you got a, you got some uh, records and uh, a stack of stuff behind you there. <laughs> oh, that's my collection. Oh. And well, the, the rest is the stock of my label. Right, right on, right on. So, if you are uh, unaware, how do you how, how do you want to go by with this interview, uh, Rector? Rector Stench, Alex. Oh, you can call me Alex. Yes, Alex is fine. Alex is fine. <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> of course. So. Are we online already? We no. are. We are live. Mm. Okay. Oh, it's okay. You can you can, you can have you can have a sip or whatever. Like like I said, I just woke up myself. <laughs> but uh, down in uh, Austria, there it's uh, seven o'clock right now. I guess. Oh, six fifteen. Or six. 6 Six o'clock. All right. Cool, man. So, um, explain um, to our fans, I guess, here, um, who you are and what you do. And uh, I guess let's kind of go to the beginning, I guess, a little bit. How you uh, how you got into the death metal and the underground scene and everything. Well, there's a lot of questions now. There's a lot of questions. Uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm Alex. Uh... Uh, drum of Punch and Stench. Uh, we split up 2007, as you probably know. Um, and we, I started the band in late 87, and uh, the first sessions were done like in February 88. Um, and we, we, we got immediately a deal, and then, you know, the, the history was very quick for us. But before, of course, I had another band, <clears throat> and I, had, uh, I was massive into the tape trading scene, of course, and fan signs I collected, and and um, yeah, and I I, I just uh, experienced everything when it was released, when when it came out. Um, it didn't matter if it was a demo tape or a record. I was a huge fanatic and metal collector in the eighties. Um, yeah, and that's that's that what influenced me, of course, and what what brought me to music, to make music, uh, to produce music, and in 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 the end, to punch stench. Right. So, and, uh, you know, back then I thought, you know, my goal was to, to reach a status in a, in a, in a tape trading scene. <laughs> this was my goal, you know, <laughs> and this would have been enough anyway for me, you know, to have one, two, three demo tapes out in uh, a circulation of my tape around the world. That it was, would have been enough for me, you know. Yeah. There was no, I had no, uh, I did not see us on, uh, on a label. I did not see us re uh, releasing in records and stuff, you know. So this was very far away, but like in, in one year we had like records out and, and it was crazy. It was good times, you know, because it was also very early. So uh, I guess, you know, I didn't even have to search for a record deal. You know, they, they came up to me and asked me if, if, if they could uh, sign us. I mean, and I could not even release my first official demo tape because they asked me already before. I mean, this is totally crazy. Wow. You know, wow. In like six months existence, six, seven, eight month existence, I had already the offer for a deal for Nokia Blast Records. 
I mean, how insane is this? You know? Only because of tape trading. The, right. the guy who worked there back then, uh, he got the demo tape, or actually he got a rehearsal tape. It was a rehearsal demo tape, not a demo tape. And um, because he was also a heavy tape trading uh, scene guy and he loved it and he, he told his boss back then, you know, this is a band we should sign. This is the future, you know, whatever. This is death metal and it will come and it will grow. And uh, yeah, a year later, a half a year later, we released the first LP. Wow. Wow. It can go quick <laughs> you really want to. No, but it was lucky, of course. Yeah. But like you said... Right time. Yeah, like you said, you didn't expect that at all, right? Like you just wanted to get, you know, to get together with some friends, make some cool demo tapes or whatever like that, and then all of a sudden, uh, the tapes got out, word gets out, and then all of a sudden yeah. they contact you out of nowhere, I guess. <laughs> yes, uh, and and <laughs> back then I thought, you know, I don't know if this is a good label for us because they only had three, four punk licensed punk releases and i thought this is not our label it's a punk label you know you know what should it, I mean, it's maybe not the right place for us you know we, we need a better label you know but then i thought you know for the first record i made a deal with one record you know i said if this is going good you know if you are satisfied we sign a contract for another lp so you know to, to be safe and they said yeah yeah and i think we didn't even sign the fucking contract back then uh we forgot about it and we signed it like years later so we released record to record, and every every record I made a new deal with Nuclear Blast. Wow! And of course, then uh, very quickly they signed many many bands in our genre. So it was uh, it was uh, it was a good label for us in in, in, in uh, after that, you know. Right. But when they asked us, you know, they had like shitty punk records out, and I thought this is not our world, not not our place. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just yeah. trying to I'm just trying to fix some lighting here. Uh... Like sure. it's been a it's been a couple weeks. You like the dark, huh? I, <laughs> it seems to be. <laughs> Just trying to figure out the lighting here. Um, ah, damn! It's been yeah, like I said, it's been a couple weeks since I've had this set up, and I had to move everything to go uh, go do some filming and stuff. So, uh, anyways, well, that's well, that's awesome, man. Um, so, like you said, with nuclear blast. Uh, you went late, you went record to record though. Um, but did you already, you already had yeah. the, um, like extreme deformity was out and like the demos were already out before. No, 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 no. no. Um, we started to, uh, play together in the, in the very early February 88 and we recorded our first rehearsal demo tape, which was later released, of course, as our rehearsal demo tape, mucus secretion in April 88. So like in this two months, we uh, we composed like 10 songs, 12 songs and recorded, I think, five for that rehearsal demo. This this demo I released, uh, I copied myself, copy by copy. Uh, it was a, a copied cover, of course, too. And I sent it to to friends and I sent it to some fan signs. And that's it, more or less, you know. And uh, uh yeah, this was in April 88, and I got a letter from this guy, he's dead already, It's very. he died very early, he died in the 90s, he was, um, he was more or less the right hand of uh, the owner of Nuka Bass Records, and he was an extreme collector too, and he did a fan sign, he had a label, his label was called Gore Records, he released uh, Incubus 7 inch, Macabre 7 inch, back then. So, and he was working for Nuclear Blast, more or less, yeah? Um, and he contacted me, like, in September, October, uh, 88. Then he got that, that tape, through tape trading, of course. And uh, he loves it, and uh, he would like to do something with us. And uh, he, I, he's working now with Nuclear Blast, so, uh, you know, he can initiate a deal with us. Right. And I told him, well, well, I have to think about it, of course, because it's a punk label, I don't know if it fit there. And then... Um, <laughs> Then, then we had um, we had uh, our first show outside. No, our first show in Germany, not outside Austria, in Germany. Uh, let me think. It was in uh, I can't remember exactly when, but it was like uh, in in late eighty eight, early eighty nine. And we met him in person. We played not far away from where Nokia Blast is from in the south of Germany. And he came to the to the show. Um, with a contract already and uh, said yes uh, yeah we can do that i mean uh, we just recorded uh, in summer 88 we recorded a real demo tape in a studio in a real studio uh fourth songs 
in England, and uh, I want to release it as a demo tape first. I told you, yeah. I don't know if you want. I want. To, I have no. You know, I want to release the demo tape and see what happens then. You know, maybe I get a better deal, whatever. You know. Yeah. I, I didn't think about that record deal. You know. So, but he said, no, no, no. You can sign with us. We released the demo tape. I said, EP or seven inch or whatever. I said, well, yeah, why not? You know. I mean, then. Then he said he wants uh, he wants uh, to sign uh, two Austrian bands at the same time. He wants to sign Punch and, and Disharmonic Orchestra, and we we played this, this show together with Disharmonic, and um, so he came to that show, like I said, and uh, he said uh, I sent you this we, we we give you this deal and we sent you to a studio in Germany you, re, you record uh, five six tracks as as much as you have for for your side and we do a split LP. And I said, okay, we can try this. You know, if it if it works out good for us, then we continue with you. If not, then we go somewhere else. You know. Right. And so, and and we recorded, I think, in in March or April '89 already. This this split be, you know, in in a studio in Germany. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, so there was no time for me to release that demo tape we recorded uh, in summer '88. Uh, and because the the split will be. Uh, uh, you know the sales were amazing, of course, uh, for for them. You know it was like something new, brand new, and it was not a punk record. It was more grindcore, death metal. So he said we need immediately another release. I said, well, yes, you can have uh, just the, the demo tape. We don't have so many songs to to immediately record an LP. You know, so we just recorded uh, six or seven tracks. You know, for the split LP. Yeah. So that's the reason why they they released uh, in September '89, I think, that seven inch Extreme Deformity, which is the three tracks of that demo tape were recorded the summer before. Wow. It was never planned to be released as a vinyl. But, you know, it, it, it was sounding okay, you know. We recorded uh, in England at the same studio where uh, Napalm Death recorded uh, From a Slave Room to Federation. And um, uh, luckily I was at the, at the mixing, when Napalm Death did the mixing for this record at that studio. And I said, wow, this is amazing. It was a little shitty studio in the end, but it was amazing sounding and it was very cheap studio. So I said, you know, we will record our demo tape here. That's what we did. You know, some weeks later. Holy crap! But then, you know, it didn't came out as as an as a demo. So, and then uh, we recorded before this was released. We recorded split, and then the demo came out, came out as a seven inch. And a year later, we recorded the next, the first LP for them already. Wow! And it was very very quick. You know. Yeah. Holy cow! I mean, that almost didn't even give you time to like to settle in. To the fact that you know this is happening, we're starting to play some shows. We just got Whoa. a record deal and all this, and it's like, okay, uh, I, <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> I mean, you have to imagine uh, all of us. Uh, nobody was uh, what was ever studied in in on the instrument. We all were playing, you know, or talk for our first time in a room. We we, we we rehearsed and learned to learn the instrument in the end, yeah? right. in 86, 87, when I had my first band. Yeah? Honestly, I mean, I could never play drums before. And the guy said to me back then in, in 85, 86, uh, you know, I want to form this and that. And, you know, I could imagine you can play the drums. He said, well, I never had, I had never had sticks in my hand, but I can try, of course, if you give me a drum set. So he bought me that drum set. That's the reason why I was a drummer. If he would have bought me a bass guitar, I would have been probably the bassist. So, uh, and, two, and two years later, I, you know, I started with Pungent. So, I mean, in the first one or two years, 88, 89, we more or less, you know, teached ourselves on the instrument, got better, got tighter together, of course. We rehearsed a lot. We rehearsed like three, four times a week, which was a lot for us. Um, you know, we had no job. We had time. So, um, you know, we did music to, and, and it got, it got faster and better, you know, so everything was very easy, you know, for us to learn and to, to, uh, uh, to, to go somewhere, you know, but I mean, still, I did not expect any record deal or any, any offer, you know? Wow. So it was easy and good for us, of course. I mean, I have to say it was in a very lucky position, but I think many bands experienced similar, uh, developments, you know, in their career in the beginning, because somebody came up to them and told them. You know, I saw you live. I heard your demo, whatever. I, I, I got a letter. We said uh, through my tape trading activities, I, I like that. I like your band. You know, let, let's do an EP with us. So let, let's do something together. You know, so I think um, this was the beginning also for labels, not only for bands. You know, right? Holy cow! Holy cow! And like you said and, too, it's it was it, yeah. it, it it's kind of like the beginning of the era also of like of like actual death metal and grindcore and all this kind of stuff, right? So yeah. So people were excited. It was, it was really, 
the beginning, it, it felt like it is beginning more or less simultaneously in Europe and in the States and maybe also in Japan. Um, and, 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 and somehow, you know, uh, because the, these, these demo tapes circulated so, so much, you know, yeah. and then you got version tapes from this band and a live recording from that band. And it, 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 it was like a, it, it was an inspiration for everybody somehow, you know, and, um, I thought, you know, a letter took a while, you know, <laughs> they had to make the copy, they had to make the tape copy, you have, had to send it. I, you know, everybody made lists, you know, I have this, you have that, let's yeah. change. Yeah. So it, it, it takes also some time, you know, but still it was so quick somehow. And, um, and, 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 and it was so fresh and new that I guess uh, more and more people got interested in it. And the fan sign culture, don't forget the fan sign culture. Oh, that was this huge. This very yeah. much. Yeah. You know, that was huge for I sure. Mean, I'm not talking about magazines. I, I talk really about copied, uh, photocopied uh, fan signs. Good old fan signs. I remember zines. brain damage. Oh yeah. Okay. What is this? That that's a. It? It, it was just it was a newer fanzine called uh, the Putrazine. Uh, okay. The friends of ours in um, in the band Undergang from Denmark, and he's been putting out some old school fanzines. And it's the old ways too, like you said. It's just a, uh, you know, copy paste, uh, typewriter, all that kind of stuff, right? Yes, I did. I did uh, uh, a fan sign myself in the eighty six, eighty seven. You know, this was also a good chance. You, you got letters from from bands you never heard of. You know, yeah. You get you you got um, you, you had a communication with with people all over the world. You know, they send you demo tapes, they send you requests, they send you uh, tape trading lists. And, um, and you feature them in your little fan sign. You sell maybe 50 copies, 100 copies in your hometown. But, you know, it was a start, you know, for, for many people. And uh, after the second or third issue, it got a little bit better, say, lawyers, and, and more and more people showed interest in, in these bands. So, you know, and I guess that helped, that, that helped many, many bands and also labels. And um, it, um, that's also why it, 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 it was growing so quick, you know, this, this exchange of music. Yeah, no, totally. And I mean, and and like I said, it was all new and fresh, so it was exciting. And and Absolutely. and nobody's heard of you know, like Napalm is kind of, is is starting to pick up some steam, and you know, Carcass was kind of picking up some steam and all that stuff. So so to start coming up in those ranks and like especially you guys were trying like the 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 whole look of it. It was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't gory, but it was kind of sadistic and, uh, like what was, what was kind of, you know, your idea at the beginning of what Pungent wanted to be like? Well, I'm a sadist <laughs> in general. That's, that's, you know, you, you always can do uh, best what you are, you know? So right. I'm a little bit sadistic anyway. So no, but, uh, in the beginning, look. You have to see. Um, I had a very strong connection in to England because I met uh, the Nickel Best guys in. Let me see, 1987. Uh, I met them. Uh, I, I went to a, a show. I think it was their first show in Germany. And um, very underground, very underground. I met uh, the Messiah guys from Switzerland there. I met Dave Phillips there from Fear of God. I met so many underground people there because, you know, it was one of the very first shows on, on the continent for them. And I spoke to Mick Harris and I spoke uh, to Bill Steer, later Carcass, and um, they invited me to England. And I said, really? Okay. So and I think the next month or maybe two months later, I was in England. I hitchhiked to England. Um, and, uh, I, of course, I phoned Mick Harris first. I said, I will come, you know, approximately on that day. I'll try to be there at that day because, <laughs> you know, I have to hitchhike. I, I have no money for a train. So I hitchhiked there. I hitchhiked to Birmingham and stayed with him. I stayed in, in his parents' house. And uh, so he, he took me to rehearsals of Napalm Death. Uh, and Bill said that the rehearsal, you know, if you, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to go to Liverpool, you know, you can visit me. Uh, you know, I live at my parents' house. You can stay there too. I said, yes. Uh, then I hitched back to Liverpool. I stayed there a couple of days. Then I hitched back down to Ipswich, to Extremist Terrace, rather place, you know. Mick Her I met Mick again. I went with Mick uh, to Ipswich to, because he played also drums in Extremist Terror. Yeah. So I had, a, I had a strong connection. You know, I, I also stayed in Coventry with Lee, Lee Dorian. And, uh, and, and I realized, you know, that Tate Ray is huge because Mick Harris, he, he was a, 
it was a really big tape trader. He was extremely tape trading with uh, with a lot of American guys. I remember he was uh, he was he was in, in in touch with some bands already with Mobile Angel and uh, Death, uh, and I'm I'm sure also Massacre, uh, because he showed me all these tapes and he made copies for me. I, I think I brought home a hundred demo tapes alone from Mick Harris' house in, in copy, of course. Yeah? I had really nothing with me. I had one little shitty suit bag, a suitcase or bag, and there was maybe three T-shirts inside and one trouser, and the rest was only tapes. It's unbelievable. I stayed one month in England. That influenced me a lot, of course, and uh, and I, uh, I visited them again next summer. All the summer, you know, I was still in school, and next, the, the summer was, next summer was 88. Pungent was already active. Uh, before that, uh, Mick Harris came with Extremist Terror to Vienna. I did a show for them. They stayed at my house, at our house. And then uh, and in, in summer 88, <clears throat> um, I said, I will come again, you know, I hitchhiked again. And, they, and he said, you know, come, let's let's come, uh, try to, to be uh, at that special special week uh, in England because we will have our mix of uh, the second LP. And I said, okay, I will try. And so uh, I reached it in time and uh, I was at the final mixing uh, days in the studio of uh, From Enslavement to Obliteration, and then that's that's what, what I, where I decided, you know, this is the place where I, uh, I can see the first demo tape for Punch Stench be recorded. Yeah. And uh, then I called back home and told my guys in Vienna, so you better come, you know, soon. I booked the studio now for like in two weeks or whatever. You try to be here in time. And they succeeded also. They also each tag. And um, we rented guitars, I think, or I don't know where they came from. We didn't bring it, of course. We used the gear from the studio. I have no idea. And yeah, we, we booked the studio for one day. So wow. we, recorded in one, we recorded and mixed in one day four tracks. And, uh, <laughs> and, and um, I think uh, <laughs> I got only a tape uh, uh, of the studio, a cassette. And I told the guy, uh, I, I make the payment um, for, for the studio cost. So maybe we paid it, but I said, I need that tape, that, that um, recording tape, of course, too, you know, not only that cassette, yeah. you know. Uh, and he said, yes, yes, uh, send me your address or give me your address. And, you know, you have to pay me extra and uh, I don't know how much. And then I send you this by post. So, um, but we never, re we re never released the demo as a demo. So... You know, I forgot about it in the first weeks. And when I called him, you know, and, and told him, you know, it's time that you sent me the tape. <laughs> uh, he said uh, he doesn't have it anymore. He uh, because he thought uh, we will not uh, send him the money. Uh, he he over recorded already with somebody else. <laughs> the fucking prick. So the only thing I had from that studio was that cassette I brought with me. And from this cassette, uh, Nuke Blast did the seven inch. And because because it was four tracks, Always said it was four tracks. It was four tracks, and it was too long for the seven inch. Only three tracks ended up on the seven inch. And uh, me, stupid, I, I think I never did a copy of my tape, so I gave the original copy, you know, to Luca Blast, you know, to have the best quality sound wise. And uh, yeah, and uh, he lost it, of course, too. So the fourth track never was released. Oh. Yeah, this was this was the early days, you know, like the, also the Spindle P. Uh, was uh, the, the the tapes the recording tapes were uh, were re-recorded from uh, with somebody else after us. They they did not keep it. Uh, Luca Blast paid for it, I guess, but they did not. Did not. Uh oh. -uh. Luca Blast money for the recording tapes, but but kept them. He said, yeah, they are safe here. But he, he he reused them. So he asked all the time when somebody came and recorded, he asked money for that uh, recording tape, but he never gave it He never gave it to the, to the label or to the band. He used it all the time, so all the recordings are lost. That's the reason when we, when we re-released For God Your Soul in the States in 1992 or 93, it was not possible to do a, a remix of the record because he had to admit that he... Uh, we recorded one tape at least, you know, only one, one tape was, was uh, still there. The other uh, was, uh, he recorded somebody else over our recording. So uh, we only had six or seven tracks left from the original recordings we could use and, uh, and remix and the rest made a re-record. That's the reason why the, some tracks are re-recorded. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's so stupid. We should have collected all these tapes, of course, immediately. But, you know, you know, <laughs> 
it was not so important back then. I had my cassette, my little cassette in my pocket. And um, yeah, uh, you, you don't think about it that you maybe need it again, you know? So, right. No, well, yeah, exactly. You don't, and you're young, you're excited, yeah. you know, you're just handing tapes out and whatever. You yeah. want everybody to hear the it. The interests are somewhere else. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and also, look, I blasted a big mistake because they trusted the guy, of course. They said, yeah, yeah, that's safe there. If you need a, a, a remix or whatever, uh, he has it there in his archive. You know, there was no archive. There was fucking maybe one or two reels. He, re, he used it all the time when somebody came to record to save him money because he was also broke, I guess. Yeah. Oh. Very ridiculous. We couldn't even sue him because I think he was bankrupt anyway then. No? <laughs> yeah. And the English and the English studio, you know, it was just one day recording that guy saw. He will never see us again, and he never saw us again. But you know, he will probably never hear from us uh, because I, I just I should have told him immediately send me the tapes or give me the tapes, but I didn't because you know I, I, I was still on my trip in England and. And when I came home, I had other things to do, and I copied the demo tape around and sent it around to specific addresses and stuff. And then, <clears throat> when you know, when the question was, "Where are the original reels or original tapes?" You know, I said, "Ah, oh, still in England." You know, and it was too late already. You know? He did maybe ten recordings already on these tapes. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But at least you know, it's not completely lost. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, were you happy with the re-recordings of For God? Well, yes, it was a different time, you know. We were not really happy with the first, with the result of the Forgot Your Soul recordings, from uh, the original recordings, and um, Forgot Your Soul was not released in the states back then. It was only released in Europe, nineteen ninety, and when we released ninety one, Pink Card, which was very successful, which was our first release in the states, also, uh, Relapse Records, the partner of Nuclear Blast, asked um, to you know let's. Let's release uh, for God your soul properly in the states. Not that you know, and, and, and import is too expensive. And now there's a scene now there. And I said, yeah, sure. But uh, and then we told Luca Blast, you know, we are not so happy with for God your soul because it sounds much better. Uh, what do you think if you you know we, we make a remix? We just make a better mix of for God your soul and right. then re-release it, re-release it in, in the states and re-release it in Europe. And I said, yeah, sure, you can do that. Yeah? And then we found out. That one tape was already re-recorded. No? Wow! If, wow. If, if, if there wouldn't have been uh, the request, we would have never asked for the tape. No? Yeah. But so we found out, and then he said, oh, yes, "I'm very sorry. I only have uh, part one of the recordings, and I will send it now to you. But I don't have the other tape. It's 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 lost. You know. I mean, it's it's re-recorded from some, something else. So we had no other possibility. And then we had a studio uh, booked anyway for uh, recordings for. Uh, Dirty Rhymes and Psychotronic Beats and uh, in the same session we, re- we re-recorded these tracks for Pot Good Soul. Wow, wow. And, and then then, then we, yeah, and then uh, we also had to change the cover because uh, we didn't have the rights for it and they, they were shitting in their pants, you know, yeah, we don't want to get sued, you know, it's an American guy, blah, blah, blah. Said, okay, then, then we changed the cover also. We make a new release out of it, more or less, you know, right, recorded, yeah. remixed, uh, new cover, blah, blah. There's a reason why it looks different, sounds different. It's the only reason. Right. Wow. Eric, can you just turn your phone sideways, like uh, the, the landscape? <laughs> Try, that. Try that. It's in yeah, I'm gonna try that because because uh, like for some reason your face is like blowing out on the screen or whatever. Hold on a sec here. Let's like this. Yeah, let's try that there. Uh, there we go. Oh my God! Now we can see you. Holy shit! All right, that's all I had to do. <laughs> oh my God! Like I said, I'm fucking waking up too. You're good. All right. So um, I personally. I personally liked uh, the original recordings because the the bass tone on that album was like nothing at that time, really. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's good. Um, I have to find the right place for it, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, yes, um, it's it's um, it's. Um, it has something. I, you're right. It, 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 it's, 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 not a, it's not a shitty sounding record. Not at all. Not but, at all. Uh, back in 91, 91, 92, you know, I was never happy with the recording. So not of the split of being, of nothing. It, it was, uh, wow. at, at that time, it was okay for me, but it was never fully satisfied until Pinkard Buttery. Wow. Pinkard Buttery for me was 
was sound wise our best record best sounding record from, the, from every every instrument and from this from all together you know it was like a really good good record i think um and then of course everything you did before you're not happy with sure right because i mean like you said uh, you're you're trying new studios you're just trying to figure out your sound uh like your tones everything like that you guys are becoming better musicians and everything so like you said by the time uh for god your soul came out and and did its run been caught comes starts starts rearing its ugly head and you guys know that you want a little bit of you know a little more rock and like a little bit of rock riffs in there well, that this is not the, the this is not the reason so really is really the sound how, how it was recorded and 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 we were not we were not totally it was not 100 percent what what we were looking for when we when we finished even in the studio, we were not totally satisfied. It was it was okay, but you know, we had a certain amount of time there. That the Luca Blast said, "You have I don't know five or six days, yeah, for everything." Okay, then uh, it was said uh, we have to record it live. Yeah, it was recorded live. So if one one person of us made a mistake, we had to start from the beginning. Yeah, so what you can hear: drum, guitar, and bass is really a live take. Wow. It's going to be uh, extremely formative for the songs all live. Yeah, so. One one uh, mistake of somebody, everybody again. So you can imagine it was not the best. It wasn't the one was not the best circumstance to 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 record this. You know, Being Caught was the first record. We recorded drums first, then bass, then guitar, blah 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 blah. Yeah, overdubs. So, wow. and and there are many mistakes of all that you saw. But I remember. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I can't tell you now. Yeah, it's too long ago. And then you know. But back then, I could hear them, you know. Yeah. I could hear mistake here, mistake here, there. But as little mistakes, you know. We didn't care so much, and we said, "Look, we played now twenty times. I, I just can't play it anymore. Let's go <laughs> to the next song." Yeah. You know? yeah. And then fuck it, nobody will hear it, you know. I'll make a solo over it or a scream over it or whatever. So you know, we tricked around, and then it was good enough. But when we had the chance to re to release it in the states, you know, after being caught, we thought, "Okay, now is the time to fix some mistakes," you know. Now is the time to fix the sound, make it very heavy, you know, or whatever, you know. And then we found out that it's not possible completely. Huh? Wow. But uh, yeah, uh, wow. because from big hold on, we, we could record uh, the way we wanted to record, you know, piece by piece. Right. And not live. It's and okay to play live. Yeah, it's no problem. Yeah. Of course. But then I can, then uh, it has to be more, you know, it was it was also very early for us, very very in the beginning. You know, it was a little bit too early maybe to make a live recording. Yeah, uh, from ninety one, ninety two on. You know, it would have been more, it would have been more logical for us to record live because we were a very tight band. We played a lot live. We rehearsed a lot. Ninety one, ninety two, ninety three, ninety four. Very very tight band, and and we got much better as musicians. You know, so. That would have been made more sense to do it then, but we did it in eighty eight and nine ninety because we had to because uh, of time problems, you know. Uh, this split will be we recorded I think five tracks on the split side of us, but we recorded two more because Nuka Plus needed a compilation track and this and that. So we recorded I think seven tracks in one day and on the second day the mixing. <laughs> live. Everything live. Yeah? Seven wow. tracks. It's almost an LP. I mean, it was shorter songs, okay, but it's almost an, uh, it's like a Slayer length LP, uh, maybe half an hour music. We recorded it really in one afternoon, uh, and overdubs, I mean, um, guitar solo, yep. overdub, and vocals, of course, was, was an overdub. But then um, on the next day, and the mixing. So it was uh, a very, you know, very quick, wow, a uh, quick thing, you know? extremely formative one day. One day recording and mixing in four songs. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I can't remember. Forgot your soul. We stayed maybe five, six days in the studio, but I mean it's a full EP and yeah. Wow! Wow! So the, the overdubs, the overdubs. I think forgot your soul. We only, I think we recorded in two days the full uh, LP, like one side a day, and the rest of the days was uh, guitar solos, vocals, uh, and mixing. Wow, there's a lot of tracks on "For God Your Soul" too. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's I'm, I'm sure 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Yeah. Wow. Um. Yeah. So you guys. It, it was different back then. Yeah. So you guys were kind of, I guess, had more of a, 
I guess a grindcore sound at the beginnings. Like you said, you guys were hanging out with Napalm and all that stuff. Was that deliberate, kind of? I don't think so. I think uh, Napalm was uh, was uh, was a fine band, and I liked the the, the pure aggression, especially live, you know. And it was nice guys, you know. I mean, just we were good friends, and uh, I I booked them in Vienna. Uh, I helped them with shows. They they let me stay at their houses. They you know uh, they just uh, were super friendly. They it felt like I knew them for 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 a long time, and I just met them. For at one show and then uh, yeah we had some chemistry together and I guess we had some some something uh, in common too music wise but Napalm was not our was not our musical influence not at all you know it's not it's a good band and everything but I never saw Pungent as a grindcore band no you know? it sounds grindcore ish maybe in the beginning because we were not able to play better. You know what I mean? It was not possible to, to play more technical. So it's, you know, of course, and it sounded noisy because the circumstances, yeah? There was one microphone in the room and then, right. you know, kind of this recording, yeah? So that that makes it more noisy. But, uh, and sure, but our influence was like, uh, I, I mean, the, the main influence for me was genocide repulsion from Flint, Michigan. Yep. This was my influence and... Uh, Death Strike, very early master. Yeah. Um, Autopsy, of course. Yeah. Voivod. Voivod Slaughter in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, because you, cause you had... Yeah, they have all the punky... The punk influence. Punky stuff. Exactly. Was... But in the end, Slaughter, Slaughter for me is 100% metal. Right. You know? It's just a dirty sounding metal it's band. It's so you know? dirty. Oh, my God. I think... <laughs> And and that's and this was Slaughter's Strapado. I mean, we even covered Strapado and Incinerator. We played that live in the very very beginning because we had, we had not enough tracks, so we had some cover songs. And Slaughter was always in the set. Wow! Right on. This was our influence, you know. Yeah. And it's I think this is a more of a metal influence or more of a metal touch than Napalm does. Right. You know? Yeah, wow. I never understood three second songs. I never understood that, you know. <laughs> this is it's nonsense, you know. I never understood, but you know, this is their approach. This is fine for me, you know. I enjoyed seeing them, you know. I was at rehearsals, I saw them live, uh, and uh, it's, it's nice guys, and everything. But it was not our influence, right? Not at all. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Carcass too. Carcass for me in the beginning. It was a mess. It was a sound mess, and honestly, it was not. It was the first record and the demos and stuff. I went with them um, in eighty in eighty seven. I think in eighty seven. I went with them to Bradford uh, for a live show they played there. Uh, support band was Paris Lost, uh, and uh, I thought, man, this is I can't I can't make out the song difference. You know, <laughs> everything sounds the same. It's like it's it's a blur. It's like a noisy blur. I couldn't understand. I mean, imagine. Uh, the, the development of, of these guys was always amazing. I right. mean, if you go to the second and third release, it's a completely different band. Huh? Yeah. But in the very beginning, it was too noisy for me. Sure, I liked it, the insanity. Yeah. I liked the, the image. I liked the, you know, the total noise. But yeah. honestly, I did I did not listen too many times to early Carcass. <laughs> I preferred more repulsion, you know. And it was like more clear for me. You know, it was like, you know, or slaughter. This was... This this sawing guitars, you know, yes. it was the, it was it was uh, there was more to 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 hear uh, out of of the music. A massacre, you know, for very first ma massacre stuff right. from Beyond, great record. And uh, this was so yeah, more influence for us than the, the English grindcore invasion. You know? Yeah, ah, cool. thought I stayed with them, you know. Right. And of course, Celtic Frost. Right. Of course, of course. Uh, Celtic Frost was our heroes and Old Venom. Of course, the older bands which already had records out, there are many around. Uh, there were many around, yeah, which influenced us somehow, you know. Yeah, yeah. Back then, they were all too good for us, you know. So <laughs> we, we took our influence from the from the tape tape trading bands, you know. But uh, <laughs> but Celtic Frost was, of course, also an influence for us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, like you said, like you grew up obviously with 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 like a punk influence, but you listen to metal. Um, and all that kind of such. So the first few albums had that feel. Um, once you got to Bin Caught Buttering, um, 
you started experimenting with different riffs or it was just you just wanted to expand the uh the the, the feel of you know you know because you started getting a little bit of stoner rock feel in there like some you know some nice rock riff or whatever how did that come about well we had uh in the 80s um you know, 85, 86, <clears throat> in the early 80s, I was listening to Mel, totally Mel, you know, it was heavy metal and, and everything, you know, from, I had to feel like every month something new is coming, you know, right. and probably it was, you know, it got faster, it got heavier, it got, it got slower, it got whatever, you know, it was great. It was, there was a constant development in, in heavy metal. And, uh, and then, you know, some, some hardcore punk bands, um, uh, I showed interest in that too because, like discharge, when I heard discharge, hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing, yeah. or why? Yeah. Such an aggressive uh, tone, you know, so so extreme, yeah. That um, or even old Swans, you know, just in yeah. the opposite way, very slow but yeah. super heavy, you know. I saw Swans in eighty five, I think, wow. in Vienna. It was so loud and so extreme, and it was not a metal band. And discharge the same or even um, Chaos UK, or I don't know what, what it was around then, back then, all these English, uh, especially English, uh, grandcore bands, yeah. Ripcord, Heresy, yes, yes. Um, Concrete Sox, Doom, In, whatever, you know, it, yeah. it, it was all kind of discharge kind of bands, you know. So <clears throat> this was also kind of an influence for us, because of the aggressiveness was just much, much more than than with these regular metal bands. Yeah, know? yeah. So, and it was... It was a crossover in general, you know, happening kind of, you know. Also, did like DRI, you know, was a great band. First, second DRI, great records, you know. And it was more hardcore, of course, than uh, maybe Discharge. Discharge was just so heavy that you know, Boybot was also a very good band which was mixing these these genres, you know. Yeah. So this was probably our our, our hardcore influence or grindcore influence, but. It was never a goal to to do this kind of music, you know. It was just the the craziness and aggressiveness we took over uh, on the first and second record, maybe. And the third record on, on Pink Cod, you know, we all always had a huge doom influence. We I, I always loved Saint Vitus, yeah? right. first Saint Vitus. I, I remember people were laughing about them. They had the the, the shittiest reviews in Germany. Shit bands, what the the, the the crappiest record of the year, Saint Vitus, and I thought, what the hell is going on? This is wow. a fantastic record. The, the mood is unbelievable. Sure, the sound is not perfect, but I mean, for me, it's perfect. But also, Saint Vitus have kind of this punky influence. Yeah, yeah. that's maybe what the back then general metalhead did not want to hear. Yeah. You know, it was very separated. You know, yeah. well, punk is punk and it's metal yeah. in the early eighties, not in the mid eighties. Mid eighties, it started to mix, and in the late eighties. The crossover was complete, but I loved Saint Vitus and I loved Witch Hunter General and I loved the uh, Death Row Pentagram. Yeah, later on, yeah, I had these the, uh, the, the the first records on, on on the cassettes, the demos, um, and I was searching for the first Pentagram for a long time and found it in Germany as an import, very expensive import, but it's a little bit more worse nowadays, so it was okay. <laughs> so you know, these these bands were also it had a, always a huge impact on us. You know, Sirid Angol, yeah. Manila Road. Yeah. Believe it or not, you know, yeah. it's this epic to me bands, you know. Uh, we always were listening to these bands, always, you know, this and we always when we composed songs, we said we start with a discharge riff and discharge beat, and then it goes over to um uh master and master beat, yeah, and then it changes to repulsion, you know, it, when it comes to repulsion, a blast beat, and then then we make a, a Saint Vitus part, you know, like it's a doomy part in the end or whatever. So we even called the parts. Uh, after all our influences, you know, we started with a Voivod kind of uh, intro, and then it, it continues to uh, uh, repulsion or whatever slaughter, you know. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> this was always, and, and so doom metal, doom metal in general had a, a huge impact. And when you when you listen to the to these old tracks, we always had slow parts, swans. Forgot your soul. I said we make a swans beginning. We play then and the first riff of Forgot Your Soul. I, I mean, you know, we played it in the beginning. We played it even longer. We said we played like very long, like you know, very repetitive, like the Swans did, you know. And so this was our Swan song in the beginning, you know. <laughs> so you know, we had all we took this. Of course, it's, if you 
if you don't know, you can't tell me. Yeah, but for us, it was uh, it was our our way to express ourselves, you know, in, in that way. Right. And uh, yeah, and then I guess it, and and back then, don't forget, I I was a you know a music lover in general, and I collected uh, records and and uh, was you know in the search for new stuff in the eighties. I was in search for extreme stuff, but later on. Uh, I was in search for, you know, music which has something uh, which touches me, you know. And then, then, then came this Trouble. I remember I love Trouble, uh, first record. It was amazing, but they changed um, a lot with the, with the Rick Rubin records. Yeah? yeah. They had this 60s feel, but had a huge impact on us somehow, you know. And to be honest, when you listen to... Um, uh, what's that track called of us? Uh, like Dirty Rams and Tragotronic Beats. Right. It's a huge trouble, corrosion of conformity influence. You know? It's hearable, you know? Yeah. Because this, of Chaos, this was very early Chaos, you know, second Chaos. This was like records we listened a lot at, at, at these years, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, I was going away from the death metal, you know, totally in the beginning of the 90s because I had my death metal in the 80s, you know? So I don't, didn't listen to so much death metal anymore from 91, 92. I preferred, uh, you know, Chaos, Trouble, um, St. Vitus, Viswino, or, um, um, I don't know, you know, these kind of bands. Corrosion right. of Conformity, Blind was a good record. Deliverance was also a good record. You know, the 70s kind of Black Sabbath kind of stuff. You yeah. Know? yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, this influenced us also. So uh, we took that inside our music, and that's a reason why I got more rock and roll. But, you know... We always listened to CC Top too. You know, we love CC Top. So <laughs> this is like, you know, let's make a CC Top song and, you know, just make it our style, of course. Yeah. 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 People will not recognize it's the CC Top influence, but, in, but, you know, for us it was, you know. <laughs> so, and then after a while, after some years, when, when we, we, when we started to compose tracks, I remember clearly we always, uh, um, we always composed in, in, in the Rose Room live. Yeah. We never, never came, a riff came or something. We, we did it together. We just, somebody started to hit the drum or play guitar and then uh, the, the other joined. And then we sessioned around until we had something where we stopped and said, this was good, let's uh, let's play this again. So, wow. and, um, and and out of these sessions, these, these songs came out. And so when we had, um, uh, you know, before recording, we had some, some favorite records we always listened to. Of course, you can hear them in their songs, yeah. Yep. But I will not tell you which ones, of course. Yeah. yeah? So you have to find them yourself. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and I, I think many bands uh, um, work like this, you know, or used to work like this, you know. Maybe not nowadays, but back then, you know. And um, you can get, you know, it's, there's, there's there's no shame in 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 to to get uh, influenced by something and and put it inside your own music and 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 do something yourself out of it, you know. Yeah. Right. If you make it that good that you can't recognize the, where it came from that year, it's it's perfect. Yeah. I think many bands do that without telling. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> so, but, uh, it's, not, it's not stealing. It's not stealing. No, I don't, not at all. I don't, I don't say uh, I want to copy this. You know, they, you have all these copy bands. This is not good. You have bands where you can tell, okay, these guys they want to sound like Mobile Angel, but it's that's not good. You know, yeah. if if you make a copy of something, you know, you should you should have your own language somehow your own sure. style you know it's you know you can take the mobile angel tracks and 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 get influenced or whatever yeah but you should do something yourself out of it you know yep. and that's what we always did i think and achieved but many bands well many bands in this genre especially and every in every metal genre yeah if there was something successful you had many copycats around you know but you ended up going into, like you said, you were big into the doom sound and all that kind of stuff. So before, ev like you know, the death metal scene was getting a little tired of things or whatever. You guys started, you know, bringing more of the rock riffs and everything. So, like Club Mondo Bizarro, like that is a, that is like a groovy record, front to back. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Because yeah. This was what I wanted to say before, because when we came together and sessioned around, you know, and then I said, well, they have to make now like an, you know, like in the old days, a uh, blast beat or a repulsions, you know, it sounded silly for us, really. 
Wow. It's on the chili. I was like, come on, this is, I don't know, this is, um... you know, we had, we had this, these times where, I don't know, maybe 92, 93 started, where where we, I did not feel comfortable to blast all the time and to to play like in the first years. You know, it sounded really stupid. And uh, the same was uh, for the guitarist also. But it was like uh, all the riffs which came out sounded silly for me. You know, like it's it. Maybe they would have been great. You know, if we would have done them five years before. But for us, it was like we have to change somehow because. I don't feel comfortable with this. I don't, I don't want, you know, we have to play the old stuff anyway live. Yeah, We have to yeah. play this live anyway. Why should we Why should we do more tracks in, in, in this style if we don't feel comfortable, you know? Right. We well, do what we want to do and we do a different record now. And fuck it, you know, I don't give a shit if people like it or not. You know, it was never my, my goal to to get huge and whatever and to, to, fulfill, to fulfill some... some um, some uh, fans uh, wants and needs, right. you know. This is not what, what this is not my goal, you know. So uh, we just do what we want to do, and then we will see what comes out. And that that's the reason for already uh, that that of Jackson Ryan beats, you know. It's already a change in this direction, and of course, as you said, it's very rock and rollish. Cut uh, But yeah. still, it's 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 very heavy, and it has this pungent language somehow. I think. Oh yeah. But just in a more way, yeah. You know? And this was important for us, you know, not 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 because uh, we didn't like to 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 uh, play in in the old vein, you know. We had to play in the old vein anyway, life, you know. Right. It, there was there was no escape for us. Yeah. <laughs> People wanted to hear that that crap anyway, you know. So there was no escape. But at least you know we have two three new songs we can present in a in in in, in a slower way or more rock and rollish way and, and 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 people liked it the direction was good so you know sure there's the the hardcore um uh, the hardcore fan i only listen to the first and second because the rest is bullshit guy sure this is fine yeah then just yeah. just listen to the first record and, and be happy you know yeah <laughs> if uh yeah that's that's fine with me you know but you know, I have to enjoy myself too. You know, I, I'm not doing it for you. You know. Yeah. No, totally. So that's the reason why we developed somehow. You know, until we broke up the first time. You know? Right. But uh, I mean, it's good for the live shows too, though, because that breaks up just you know the live the live set itself. You could throw in your blast beats and all that kind of stuff, and then all of a sudden you break down, and it's like Clister Boogie kicks in, and then all of a sudden you just got you know. You got a different groove and you got another vibe going on, right? So it, so it worked out for that. It, 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 yeah, uh, and we found out ourselves. We, we couldn't we couldn't imagine how the reaction will be, but um, it showed us when we played live and, and the, the record uh, sold good back then. It showed us, you know, that also people uh, develop um, and maybe they had also a new audience. I don't know, but um, it, it was fun. The reaction was great, you know. I could not complain, you know, it was, um, it was a good move, you know, Yeah. in, in the end, you know, but I mean, it was also not planned. It was like what we felt we have to do. So, yeah. uh, no, totally. and, and, uh, we, 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 we kept our image, we kept our, 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 our you know, our, our extremity somehow, you yeah. know, we kept it anyway, the lyrics and the concept and the photos and whatever, and I just made it a little bit more. So, Music for the girls, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, no, you know what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, well, spe truth, spe especially with that. I, I have to say it's the truth. It's, it's the only way, you know, you can. Yeah. Stay away from the grand core. Of course. Of course. Music. Of course. Yeah. But uh, that's. Oh, cock rock. <laughs> but that psychotronic album cover. Who came up with that? Um. I remember back then. <clears throat> I was working in a record store back then. And I, I told to myself, and there was a huge store, and I, I saw all these covers on, on the shelf. It was CD, of course, uh, back then. Of, of course, my own too, but there was a, a huge CD shelf. And I was looking at the new section, all kinds of music, yeah, rock and indie, whatever. And I thought, hey, this is, I mean, if I look at all these covers, they're all crap. They're all kind of the same, you know, from, from, from the graphic style. This all bullshit, you know. I mean, we have to do something totally different, you know. And we had already forgot your soul and being caught, you know. And I did not want to have a, another another cover in that direction. But right. I thought, let's make something white, you know, but very, 
shiny white, which is not expected by people by the metal genre. And we got Mongo, even more extreme, I said, let's make something black and white. Luca Blast called me and said, you are fucking nuts. You can't release a black and white record. This is unsellable. I said, what, what's up with you? This, this sleeve will be black and white. No, it must be colorish. I said, no, everybody has a color cover. Let me make a black and white cover. Yeah. And especially for you, I have a cover where you have no problems. You just see a little monkey face, nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was a fold out. The CD version was a fold out. And it's, the yeah. fold out cover, afterwards, you could see the, the complete thing. But in, you know, it was not a cover where you, you will get sued immediately. Yeah. So I, will, I told you I will, I will make a very harmless cover from the outside and it will be in black and white. They said, no, you can't do this. You know, they, they said in the beginning, they said, uh, Alex, you have to change the logo. The logo nobody can read. I said, <laughs> are you crazy? I mean, why did I change the logo? Because no, I can't read it. I said, yes, then then it's your problem. But of course we will not change the logo. Yeah. This was this was what they told us in the very beginning. It's unreadable. Look at the logos nowadays. I can't read them anymore. No. But back then, I mean, come on, this was right. it's a joke. It was really every record we did, we always had problems with them. They always said this, you can't do this, you can't do that. But in the end, I always did what I wanted to do, you know. <laughs> so it was, it was, this was lucky because uh, there was always an argument and stuff. But in the end, they let it, they let, they let me do it. So yeah, in this case, I don't know. I thought it must be very um, uh, bright and white cover and 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 a, and a, and, a, and a very meaty picture. It would be great, you know, to have. <laughs> and uh, a friend of us, and he he he. Uh, he's also dead. Uh, he was an an art teacher, and he was also an, an singer of a very, very uh, obscure and extreme band from Austria, Vienna, and um, very big and famous in Austria. And he was singing uh, also in in, in Austrian and German language. And he uh, was also a photogra photographer, and and uh, he he did exhibitions, but small exhibitions because they were pretty extreme. And he said, "I have some pictures for you, Alex. Yeah, I can show you. You know, this is." I just had an exhibition and he brought me these pictures and I said, this is it. This is the cover. We don't have to talk about it, you know. And of course, it was a, it was a session of um, I mean, different uh, different positions of that lady. <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, and then we, we, we put it together in a graphic way, which um, I mean, I, I think it was looking different in the States. I'm really upset to censor it. They yeah. just put the head on, on the cover. No? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the uh, the actual, the the, the, the the real cover is the where you have the white, the white on one side it's white and yep. the other side is the complete photo because it was also not possible to make it look good um, because you know city the city um, the place the, the the size of the city the cover is very small right. as you know so it was not it wasn't possible uh, in a different way and with Pink Cutter, Cutter, um with um, Capmondo Pizarre, same artist also this guy. And it was also an, uh, a photo session. Did all these count pictures you have inside? I don't know if you know the, the uncensored. I don't know if, if if you ever saw the uncensored version of Psychotronic. Because in America, I don't know. Um, um, Captain Oh, uh, well, I I myself only have like you said. It's the monkey on the front when when you unfold it. It's the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the full. I have that exactly. one. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and but there's also the relapse version. There's there's this band photo of us on the front cover. Oh, okay. Oh. So there, there's there's of course an, a different version, a, a, a chain chain uh, chain store version or whatever you call it, right. a store version. <clears throat> uh, also in Germany, they released uh, the CD version also with with that with that photo of us uh, with the masks. <laughs> Because they said uh, this monkey, yeah, it's nice and everything, but it's a black and white cover. It looks there's no logo in it, you know. Yeah. Now they want to have the logo, but <laughs> they said you, you make a sticker, then you make a sticker on the fucking jewel case, and uh, that's it, you know. And then that's that's how they did it. But they were not really happy with it, so they did the second version for the for the chain stores and for for whatever whoever didn't want to have that that cover. Yeah. The same artist and the same artist gave the same artist gave us also uh, the American cover for for Got Your Soul from Your Flesh, the blue one with the ah, with okay. the three guys on the couch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, it's also from this guy, and you can hear him sing on uh, Danny Rhymes. Um, he's he's doing vocals on uh, for F Cup. Right. 
Wow. <laughs> he, he was also a big Mentos fan, and I, uh, then I phoned him and said, look, we do the Mentos cover. Uh, we could imagine you do a duet, you know? And he said, yes, sure. And he came in the studio and recorded for us, yeah. Uh, really good guy, and um, yeah. Wow. What was what was with the remixes on there though? What 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 brought that on? Like the you know that like 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 yeah like the the industrially remixes and stuff like that. How did that come about? Um, we had only <clears throat> I think we had um, we had only the 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 plan to do an, a mini LP, uh, and uh, we only had two songs, two new songs I think, the Mentos cover. And, and then I think we only had these three songs planned first. But then the, the thing with these tapes appeared, for Your Soul, yeah? we could not make, make, make the remix. Ah. So we had to re-record a couple of tracks, and one of them was Blood Bus and Guess We Choose. So we said, okay, let's let's also put Blood Bus new version on it, you know. And then uh, I said, we could, we could do also, because this was very impact then, this remix uh, stuff, especially in America, there was a lot of remixing going on. Yep. This position of that band is remixing that that song, and so we said we also make a remix of something. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not a track; it was just, and techno was very big in Europe, also. right? And I think the studio guy who um, did the production with us, he was also in this kind of music, and we said, you know, let's do something totally crazy, which which does not even fit to us, you know, and to fill the city with something, and and it, it just happened, you know, in that way. Wow. So it got longer and longer. That's the reason why there's a, it has, I think it has a playing time of 40 or 45 minutes. Actually, it's like an LP, yeah. but it's a mini LP. And uh, we just, uh, yeah, it was just, maybe maybe we just did it to piss people off. I, I can't even remember why. <laughs> it, 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 I mean, it really does not fit us. Yeah, yeah And no. the techno track was nothing to do with us, with us. Nobody was involved in that. The wow. studio guy did it. So we just put it on. Wow. Of course, there were some vocals inside. Yeah. Yeah, to, yeah. to make it look like a remix of some some stuff of us, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's fake, you know what I mean. So it's a combination of many things, you know. It's 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 um it's a it, it's in back in that zeitgeist, you know, it was asking for this. This the the, the back then zeitgeist was asking for a remix of us, you know, and nobody did a remix of it. So we had to create some remix of ourselves somehow, you know. Right, right, right. So then I did a long techno track and put some vocals uh, of another track of, of us inside to make it look like a a remix, which it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> how Stupid, did, but you know. How did that album do though? No, very well. It was very well. It was very well accepted. It was um it was the one after being caught. Yeah. It was very well accepted in, in Europe. <clears throat> especially Germany. I remember we went to some, you know, Germany, they have some, they have these big uh, discotheques on the countryside where all the people drive uh, on the weekends and um, they, have, they have also these metal discos, you know, where hundreds of metal people come together and uh, they listen to a DJ. And we, we, we heard uh, Viva La Muerte there on massive speakers, you know, <laughs> and all these people were happening there. I thought, fucking hell. I think um, uh, we did the right track to the right time. Yeah. And also, why can't the buddies fly? Ah, we did this car version. This, this also on this record. Why can't the buddies fly? Mm. Do you remember? Uh, it's, also, it's also on Dirty Rhymes. It's a cover version of an Italian disco band. Oh. And um, and this Italian disco band did a soundtrack for a, a crime detective series, a German crime detective series. And this is the, the title track of this crime detective series, yeah? And the, the psychopathic killer uh, always plays this song when he's uh, threatening girls on the phone. You can hear the track, or he, he, you can hear the track when he murders somebody. And it was a big hit in Germany, Austria back then, in 83, 84. Wow. And the, the original this track came from an uh, Italian, very obscure disco band uh, called Warning. And uh, in the actual disco track, the vocals are very close to the vocals we have. Yeah? Very, very bizarre disco music, I have to say. Uh, and they also had masks and, and, and strange clothes on. And it was a very uh, interesting band, to say the least. So, and we said this would fit us perfectly, you know, and it's, it's a great track, I think. It's a, and this, this track we also heard in many discotheques in Germany because it was such an, um, an ear catcher. And um, 
and maybe some people remembered it as a as a as a hit in the eighties. Maybe I don't know, but at least you know we had the punch version now, and it was a very big hit. And I think the the record was also successful in in, in America. And uh, we had a release in Australia and toured with it first time there. I remember it was great too. So yeah, and then it was clear for us, you know, we will continue with this rock and roll stylish uh, right. death metal, you know. Right. Wow. This was our intention and our in our in our. This was our interest you know, to to develop somehow our style anyway. So it right. was good that direction were very, very positive. Oh. Maybe not for the diehard fan, but you know, who cares. Right. Well. <laughs> But you guys, but, but yeah, but like you guys were doing, like you're just progressing. You're, you know, the j music is just opening. How old are you? Uh, Fifty one. Fifty one. Okay, so you grew up in the seventies and the eighties and everything. Like, and and you, you got into music early on. So obviously your genres, you know, you're all over the place. You like the Italian disco. You like the rock. You like heavy metal. You like all kinds of stuff, and. When it gets into, like you said, your band, you know, grindcore, and then we went into rock and roll, and then you start bringing some of those older influences back that you like. So, like you said, you bring in this Italian disco kind of band to start integrating with your stuff because, you know, you're getting you're into the you're into the movie side of everything too, right? With the European cinema and everything. Absolutely. I mean, this this was not the they maybe they they total intention back then, but. Um, you know this this crime crime um, television series was very popular in Germany and Austria and it still is still is it's still still on and um, they they have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, main main titles uh, from different artists and but in this particular way it was a very catchy track very catchy track and very um, with very extreme lyrics uh, at least voice uh, we didn't we couldn't even tell what he was singing. So, you know, we were, and we've never found any lyrics. So there's no lyrics in our track too, of course. It's just want to be English lyrics. Yeah? It's not, there's nothing you said. Yeah. So, uh, because I think this Italian vocalist is not singing anything too. Yeah? <laughs> just the, the, just the, just the, the refrain, of course, yeah? by Candy Bodies Fly, right. but nothing else. Yeah? So, and this, but this, this was so uh, special that we thought, you know, this could be also a very special track with us, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it worked. And of course, this film connection is nice too. Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you know, our our influence also back then, you know, <clears throat> we we on the road. I remember that we had uh, in the earlier days we had cassettes and later on we had CDs with us. And I I remember the first American, second American tour. I listened to a lot of Black Sabbath back then, you know, that was also a very big influence, always, you know, for me, you know, Black Sabbath was always there for me. I, I love Born Again, I love uh, the, the the Dio records, you know, this this I always can hear, you know, so like Black Sabbath was a very big influence on us, you know, I have to admit, yeah? I mean, maybe you can hear it anyway, but. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, and, and the longer we played together, the they, they, they more we got, you know, influenced by the 70s, you know. Right. Which was no influence in the beginning of us. Right. You know? Yeah. So. So you kind of almost, you almost like, not, I wouldn't say started the move of, you know, bringing rock and roll into like death metal and extreme music and stuff like that. But you kind of did before, you know, Entombed came out with Wolverine Blues and, you know, all that sort of thing too, right? The death and roll, I guess you want to call it, and people want to call it. Uh, but you were just doing it because you loved it, not because all of a sudden you hear all these bands going, oh, hey, that sounds cool, maybe we should incorporate that. It was, no, you're, you're, you're putting it in because fucking 70s, you know, doom Absolutely. and all that rules. I don't like this death and roll. We, we, I think don't think we are we, we, we are not a death and roll band. Right. Uh, and and I think these these records came out after our record. Yes. Oh yeah, totally did. Totally so, did. It was not an influence. In, of course, obviously, it was not an influence for us. Our influence was the second Chaos. Yeah. Blues for the Red Sun. Yes. That's a title. Uh, Corrosion of Conformity. I think Blind. Blind was the title of that record. Yeah. Trouble, the first trouble on Def Jam, and the second trouble that was called Only Trouble, and the second trouble on Def Jam. Can't remember the title now. Um, yeah. And Black Sabbath. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's enough. It's enough for, for me to make a record. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so this this back then this was a big influence. Maybe there's some other bands. Uh, we, 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 I, I can't recall my other bands we we listened. Ah, I have to say, I never was a grunge fan. I hated it. You know, actually. me too. Me too. Not hated it, but it's the wrong word. But I I disliked it. You yep. know, uh, because it took um, it took a lot um, of the right music and did wrong music. You know, right? And it was too successful too. Yes. You know? And uh, and I didn't like the attitude from these guys. And as you can see, all of them, most of them, drug addicts or suicide. I mean, it's it tells a lot. You know, I didn't yeah. like this attitude. I, yeah. I don't know. I had nothing in common with it. But this is a, this is a problem. Our bassist had. Yeah? He was he was a huge fan of all these. Of, and there's a reason. He's the same kind of guy. Told drug addict, and we we should have kicked him out uh, years before, but we didn't because we thought, you know, it's a nice guy, and you know, yeah. we just didn't want back then. We didn't want any changes, uh, lineup changes. So, but he was a big Alice in Chains fan and Soundgarden and and whatever Nirvana maybe too, and Red Hot Chili Peppers and all this crap. I could not hear it anymore. Yeah. I, he always tried. To, you know, I, I mean. Uh, I mean, he was not a he was not he was not a songwriter in the band. Right. Know? He was. In the beginning, always there. Later on, he wasn't there because drugs were more important. But um, uh, the guitarist, he, he also, you know, he, he was also kind of a kind of a uh, he, he followed also trends somehow. And, and also, the, all these bands, you know, were just you could hear them. He, there was no escape where you went. You, you could hear fucking Red Hot Chili Peppers, oh. but there was no escape, you know. So maybe a little influence also from these shitty bands came. Maybe yeah. you know, for Cap Mondo, not yeah. from my side. Yeah. Because, you know, as I said, I don't like him. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, this was also, this was this grunge kind of stuff. Maybe there was one or two good bands around. I don't know. Yeah. I can't remember. But this this was also maybe not even um, a direct influence, but because it was overplayed yeah. everywhere. And, 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 and maybe it was also a little bit affecting our our style, you know, in, in doing stuff. Maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we... we if then then we took more more the piss out of it, you know. Then we just used re reused it in in, in in for our because Soundgarden, I mean, they just they, they stole Black Sabbath stuff, you know, and right. and, and made it made it their, themselves their their style, which is not really true, you know. Um, so uh, maybe this was also kind of uh, you know this was a zeitgeist uh, uh, thing, you know. Yeah, it was yeah. just around, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. And, um, so and, is that but, is, is, so is that kind of why yeah. the band started to kind of, I I guess, did it fizzle out, I guess? No, I don't know. Um, we were very, very, very successful, especially in 94. Yeah. Uh, we released um, Cap Mondo Pizarre, I think, in April 94. And then we had a European tour, which was like, Nine or ten months long, together with Brutal Truth and, and Macabre. Wow. All over Europe. Really good tour. And then we had a, uh, in summer 94, we composed uh, the next album already, completely. Didn't record one note. <laughs> and because we split up in 95, right. it was lost, of course. So, uh, so but in, summer, in, in, in that summer break, we, we composed a complete uh, album. And then we left to America. And we did uh, two months, three months, two and a half months with Acid Bath and uh, Rule Throws again. Wow. And uh, it was a very um, uh, successful year with many, many shows. And uh, we were on our height, you know. It was like financially and, 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 and sale-wise and show-wise the, the, the strongest year. Right. You know? And the, the tour in America, it went until 1995. Uh, because we played in 95, we played in Canada. We played uh, in Montreal, <coughs> I think, in Quebec. I went sick, I couldn't play. And uh, I think we had, we had three or four shows, but I think we only succeeded playing one in Canada. Wow. Because first they didn't let us in. <laughs> um, because the, the club, they, really, this is what I recall now. First they didn't let us in, we, we came there. And they said that at the border, uh, ah, you're a rock band, uh, mm -hmm. where do you go? And we said, I think we go to Ottawa. And 
uh, he said, oh, but what is the club name? And he said, let me see and uh, check my, my list. And I told him the club name is this and that. And then this guy from customs, uh, he went back in his office and he came out again. This club has no license for whatever. I didn't even understand what he was talking. He, no license for alcohol or s selling or whatever. And he said, you're not, not allowed to go there and play that show. I said, what the hell is going on? What a strange country Canada is. <laughs> so he said, you can, you, can, you can cross the border tomorrow. You have to stay in America now. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I don't know what, what was happening. He said they have no license for the show or whatever, or for alcohol serving. And, and he knows if, if he lets us over, we will play that show. So we better stay in America and come back tomorrow. Wow. This is what I remember. And then we came again. I was I went very sick. We came again. We went to Quebec, but I could not even stand up anymore. I, I had to lay down. So the guys were at the show. I couldn't could, couldn't be there. And then we went to Montreal and I played very still very sick, but I, I had to play because we needed all of the money yeah. to play the show in Montreal. Uh, and then we went back to New York, and I think we finished the tour. This was at the end of the American tour, which started in early November. So it was like two months, two and a half months. Yeah. Wow. Wow. It was crazy, crazy times. <laughs> and on that tour, <clears throat> uh, too many drugs, you know, uh, it's about, it, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, not me, uh, I'm, I'm totally against drugs, but the bassist, he, he was, um, he was on, uh, you know, uh, too many uh, drug abuses, I have to say, um, and too, too many problems in between each other already, you right. know, starting. I didn't feel comfortable, and um, when we came home, <clears throat> I stayed long in New York. Uh, they they flew home. I stayed longer because I waited for a carnival show. I remember <laughs> nice. um, they made a <laughs> they made a, a one off show in the, at the limelight, <clears throat> and I knew Peter, and uh, I waited a one week in New York and uh, for that show. I remember, yeah. and then I came home to to Austria and and uh, called the guys and said. Um, we need some money, you know, we have some, some debts because of the tour. I don't can't remember exactly, but we need some money. We have to play. There was one more show in February in Vienna. We have to play this show because we need that money to pay these debts, whatever. So we, we met, we played that show. And then I never called this guy again. And they never called me again. So that's that, that more or less, you know, we never said that we break up, but we just never called each other again. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and it was just over. Right. It's very crazy. Yeah? So it was a was, was it a shock or you kind of knew it was happening? I just was waiting if somebody cares or calls. I didn't care, so I, I have no intention to call anyway. But maybe if somebody calls me, they didn't. They had no intention to. I guess so. The bassist, I was sure he will. He he would have left the band probably anyway because he was just totally yeah. no interest at all in this kind of music anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he lost the interest in music many years before, but it was an income and it was, you know, an experience also for him. Yeah. And it was an easy way to get to drugs too, uh, uh, on the road, yeah. <laughs> especially in America. Um, wow. And drug addicts uh, recognize each other. Sure. Do you know that? It's very, it's unbelievable. It's an own world. Anyway, um, so I, I, had, I had the feeling that, you know, this guy, I mean, even if we continue, we will not continue with him. But uh, also something between me and Martin happened, so we just didn't call each other, and then it was over. Wow. Then I released, uh, two years later, in 97, I, I, I did this kind of compilation, which is not a compilation, but which is a, uh, you know, first little P was never released on CD back then, uh, the, the Extreme Deformity, the demo tape, and all this stuff was never released uh, you know, properly again. So right. I put this all together. It was a two LP set and a CD box. And it was kind of a farewell all to our fans, you know. Right. It was just to have something, you know, to say uh, a goodbye or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. It was released in 97. And yeah. And then the first talks again we had in 2000. Right. And that was... Me and the guitar. And that was for Amputee? Well, Amputee came later. The first later. was uh, Masters of Moral, Servants of Sin. Right, that's right. That's it was right. in 2001. 2004 was Amputee. And 2007 uh, was uh, Smart Kingdom, which was released now, last right. year. Right. Because uh, we, we finished again. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, so you, in the meantime, while, you know, Pungent was doing it, uh, its, its hiatus or whatever it was, 
you were working in the background and getting into the soundtrack side of things. Is that kind of when it started? I always liked soundtracks. Right. No, soundtrack, the first soundtrack, so the first soundtrack I bought myself was in the 80, early 80s, 83, 84, uh, Morricone. For Whoa. a few dollars, uh, 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 for a handful of dollars, or for a fistful of dollars and for a few dollars more. This was my first uh, soundtrack LP I bought, I guess, 82, 3, 4, around that time. Wow. Amazing. And just, I mean, even now, it's just, uh, I get goosebumps when I, when I hear these tracks. It's unbelievable. Just um, just an unbelievable score. And uh, this was my, my, uh, my, my entry in, in, in the soundtrack world. Maybe, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure the entry in the soundtrack world was my interest in films in general, sure. you know, but I did not, I had no, no, you know, I, my money was short. I had to collect other stuff, you know, all the metal records, whatever. Right. So I had no money for soundtracks uh, back then. And, um, but this, this was uh, what I recall my first LP I bought. In the nineties, uh, I, 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 I bought, uh, I started to buy the first uh, score CDs and on, on, on record conventions, I was searching for old LPs, and I found stuff, and it was pretty cheap back then, but right. I was always broke, so I had no, you know, I could not invest too much in that, but, you know, I, I, I for, you know, my first goal was collect any more on it. Right. In the, in the 90s, I tried to, to get as, as many scores of him as possible, and that developed, you know, and then in the late 90s, uh, it was there was the first wave of Italian releases kept coming from from Dago Red and, and all these labels. Yeah. And um, and uh, I, I I bought many back then CD releases of course no vinyl but at least you no know, it was spared than nothing. Yeah. Mostly two films on one CD so I bought a lot a lot I mean I, and 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 more composers um, uh, catched my interest. Uh, which is which was not good for my pocket because I did it way too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, well, nowadays I don't have to tell, or I don't have to say anything about it. This is totally insane. What's happening nowadays? Right. It's totally insane. So but it's it's a new audience. It's a new. It's a new. It's a new generation. New group. Yeah. New generation for for this kind of stuff. Yeah. So for let yeah. me let me just explain yeah. to everybody out here watching uh, the the little topic yeah. and sh the shift in topics that we just had there uh, about the soundtracks. Um, if if you're not aware of of this, uh, Alex here has his own record label now called Cineploit Records, and you deal strictly with. Um, I guess soundtracks, but more specifically the European feel of um, of, of 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 the heydays. With is it, it? It's all new bands, correct? Yeah, and it's fake soundtracks. Yes, I only have one real soundtrack, <laughs> but the film is not released, so um, it's a little bit difficult to explain. Um, uh, but I will try. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For uh, since eight years now, 2012, beginning 2012, I started. Um, um, I, I I did some projects in 2010, 2011. I had some 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 sessions with with uh, with friends, and I had some some recordings. And I thought oh, it would be good to do, you know, a kind of a, a fake soundtrack of a film which is not existing. And then I thought, if we succeed, you know, making a full album. And, and, and record it. Who, who, who could release this? Uh, I think nobody, because there's 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 no platform for this. Right. Um, back then, not even not even the the soundtrack boom wasn't on, and and I could I couldn't imagine uh, who to ask, you know, who to go to, you know. Right. And then I thought maybe I do it myself, but you know, one record I can't start a label for one record. This is also nonsense. And then um, a friend of mine also. Uh, played stuff to me, which sounded very interesting, more dark ambient-ish, but you know, with a with, with a strong sound, soundtrack touch, score touch, you know. And then I thought more and more about it, you know. And then um, then through internet connections, I found uh, a guy from Canada, Frank or Francois. He's from Montreal, a French uh, French Canadian, and he he did he started Orgasmus Sonore. I don't know if you ever heard it, oh. heard about it. Orgasmus Sonore. 
from Montreal. It's a one man project, a one man band project. And he also had metal roots. He played in a thrash metal band, Canadian thrash metal band. I don't remember the name. Slayerish, I don't know. In, right. in the in the in the early eighties, early nineties. So he's in my age. <clears throat> And he has his own recording facilities, and he was he was planning his first LP. It was too early for my label, so he, he released his first LP on his his own. Uh, but I I helped him. I, I, I sold copies for him here in Europe. But I I told him, look, I will I might uh, start something, you know, with my project and with another friend's project, and I could release your second LP too if you want. And he was very happy to hear it. And I said, yes, I will do it. And then, and, and you know, I had three or four records. Yeah, I had a, I had a, um, I had a Fabio Fritti, uh, Lucio Fulci tribute record, uh, session, a recording session from the nineties. I did with another guy, um, for a double CD compilation, which was released in America on a label called Blackest Heart, Blackest Heart magazine, I think from San Francisco area. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Blackest Heart Media. That's um, yeah. that's Sean Lewis. Sean Lewis from uh, Rotten Cotton and everything too. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. That guy. He, he, I was in touch with him in the nineties by letter yeah. and fax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was before the email. Yeah, and um, he and when Lucio Fulci died, he offered me. Um, I had I had a bad project. I had uh, an electronic. Uh, industrial band and I, I had uh, several band projects running and he asked me hey can you do a cover version or something tribute to uh, Fulci, a Fulci soundtrack you know for a compilation because uh, he just died recently he died poor and we want to um, we want to collect money with the CD a release uh, to uh, buy him a, a proper gravestone I said sure I mean I can work something out you know wow. and um, I with my Industrial partner, I, I, I did two tracks. Uh, two, one, uh, one Fabio Fritzi track for uh, the Beyond, yeah, and one uh, track of Walter Rizzatti for uh, House by the Cemetery. Ah. <clears throat> and um, I, I sent him these tracks, and he he used both. It was it was a double CD. There are bands on it like Gore, and uh, a ministry ministry guy was also doing something under his, his name and. I don't know. It was like an international wow. double CD compilation. Yeah. Released 97, 98. Right. Right after Fuji's death. And so I had these recordings and I thought this would also fit to my label nowadays, you know? Yeah. Like 15 years later. So this was also released at 12 inch in everything in 2012. <clears throat> and when I started with these four um, uh, releases, yeah. I got immediately contacted by uh, a German guy who found out through a film blog, you know, that I'm, I'm doing this, and he had, he had, uh, he has also a project. He sent me his, his recordings, like in the old days. It was great. Right. It was Suspetto. You heard Suspetto, the fantastic yeah. band. Yeah, and unbelievable, fantastic. unbelievable. And I told him, I mean, I released this demo already as an LP. If you want, they said, no, 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 I can do much better. I said, okay, okay, but I mean, this is so good already, you know. Wow. And in the same month, really, in, in January 2012, when I started, when I had to spend off, the next week, I got in touch with Sultan, because Sultan were just finishing their first album. And a, a German friend of mine who was in touch with them, I didn't know them, but he was in touch with them. And he said, Alex, I have, a, I have some friends in England. They have a, um, like a synth prog, soundtrack-ish uh, synth prog rock uh, band. And they looking for a deal. I said, well, I'm... I'm just in the very, very beginning. I mean, I can't offer them just, I can't offer them all to release it, nothing else. I mean, right. if, if they want, and then I've got in touch with them, really nice guys. And with, a, with like a little similar um, past, I would say, one guy was in, a, in a, uh, he was active in a very early, it is in a new wave, British metal band. He's a little, a little bit older even than me. So um, I said, and we have something in common, Blue Oyster Cult is our faith band. So I said, okay, yes, we, we do that together. <laughs> so, you know, I, I had like in the first half year, I had six releases already. It was crazy. Wow. And I, I mean, it was just in the beginning uh, to form something. And then, yeah, I have now 35 releases, uh, vinyl releases. And uh, after some years, I started to, to, uh, um, to work on films too. But it's a different thing. But um, uh, but under the same label name, right? right. But uh, yeah, uh, and so far I have, I have many. It's it's homage. It's it's either it's a it's an uh, our own recording for a, for a film which doesn't exist, 
or it's an homage to a composer or a director or both. Right. Wow. So, so why did you? Why are you gravitating to the European uh, feel and and the Italian style of it all? Like, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, movie soundtracks. We go to Bernard Herrmann. We go to you know, he Henry Manfredini for Friday the Thirteenth and all that kind of stuff. But what is it about the European, the crime jazz, and Fabio Frizzi and all that Rizzortellini? What 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 what's up with that? Bernard Hermann is, uh, is a classical composer. Uh, I'm not a classical composer, and I think all of my artists are not classical composers. So that's that's it. it that's that whole different different kind of uh, approach. Yeah? Right. Uh, we did. I mean, um, sure. All, all of us, mostly, most of the project is one man bands only. Yeah? So okay. some wow. are two. My my, my project uh, is two members. Sultan are three. But most is like one person in the studio thing. Yeah, uh, I have a classical uh, uh, guy too. I have an Italian composer. This is the only real soundtrack. Luigi Porto is his name. He lives. He's an he's an Italian living in New York, living and working in New York City, and he is composing operas. And wow. he got in touch with me because he saw my activities and he thought this is a great label. I have a soundtrack for a for a movie which is not finished by Romano Scavolini, an old director. You might know, um, and this this would be the right label for it. I said, um, "Hello, Luigi. I don't know because uh, <laughs> I'm, you know, I had a fear that a real composer is coming with a real soundtrack. I had a fear that I'm not the right person, maybe for him, you know. Right. Um, but I am. I, I met him later on personally, and he's a, he got a really good friend of mine, and he's a crazy guy. He has, you know, he, he's kind of an he, he composes operas. But also listens to carnivore, so there must be something. <laughs> it has something in common with me too, you know. So, but you know, in the first, I did not know, you know, what what kind of guy is this? You know, maybe it's an old composer. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm not a label, you know, for uh, in a more corner records, right. you know. I'm not a I'm not a label for uh, classical soundtracks, you know. Um, but anyway, this was this was this is the only. Oh, sorry, this is the only um, the only the only real soundtrack I released so far. Yeah? Right. <clears throat> And then, um, 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 what was the question? I don't know. Uh, why? Why? <laughs> I, I remember, yeah. Why the European Italian? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, why? Um, Be because goblin uh, rules. I have, to, I, have, I have to say, not not everything is totally European. You know, like Sultan. It, actually, it's a seventies synth prog rock band. Uh, um, it got not so much in common with Italian sounds, for instance, yeah, or uh, or Silotron, the Swedish guy I have, uh, also metal background. I did not know when he contacted me, yeah, but he plays in a in a in a in a doom sludge band called uh, Kong. Maybe you heard oh, of them. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, he plays in Cult of Luna, also guitar. Oh, okay. And he, and yeah. he has, and this was like a totally it was it's a synth synth uh, 80s synth. Uh, project he has you know got nothing to do with italian stuff you know right. but he's in love with italian stuff too yeah so when when, when i did um uh when uh, five years I, I had a, a five years compilation for for cineploid like a five years of cineploid whatever and a homage to the maestro in my corner i said you know would be the topic would be great some of them you know some of my artists were like oh this is a very very difficult you know yeah. to, to make but we will try and everybody did everybody did also the like, the, the synth guys you know because they they all love him you know they all love his music um because he just is a great composer and um so even the bands which are not this is what i wanted to say even the bands which are not uh I italian uh for a uh, driven yeah um uh do respect, of course, uh, these composers and films. Yeah, um, and, and sure, on the other side, I have many, many homages on Italian to Italian composers and right. films, because it's just it's just beautiful music, and it's a uh, it's 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 a uh, great great melodies and great um, uh, greatly worked out. I, I can't even explain it better. You know, it's just it has it has there's a magic. You know, yes, which is um, which is. Um, which you can hear immediately if you have this kind of uh, taste, of course. Yeah? If if you if you don't uh, if you don't have anything to do with it, if you don't appreciate it enough, then you will not hear it. Right. But um, 
um, if you have uh, um, a sense for this, these times and these films and, and, and this music, then uh, you hear immediately after 10 seconds, you know, it, it's it's getting you. Oh, you know? yeah. yeah. And, 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 you, and you can't get out of it. You can't. It, it's like um, it's a magic what music has, you know. Yep. And what I find, what I like about the like the Italian side of, of soundtracks, the crime jazz, a goblin, all that kind of such, is it's still kind of like it's a prog band style, right? Like they have the drummer. Goblin. Yeah. Like, goblin is prog rock. Totally. This is what I said. You know, Sultan is going in this direction, more or less, you right. know? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit more modern, maybe, yeah? but but more or less in this in this in this goblin direction. Yeah? But it's kind of, but, 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 but it's, I mean, it's like a rock band, more or less. It, it, this is the, uh, goblin was a prog rock band. Yeah, was a prog rock band, uh, which was um, which had Claudius Simonetti as a keyboarder in the band, yeah. and he has an an, an father, which which uh, was a composer, yeah. Enrico, and um, that's the connection to the film right. first. And then Argento f found out, uh, or saw them, I think, live, and liked it. Yeah. Because he has a sense for rock music. And in the 70s, this was prog rock. Uh, you know, uh, they, 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 they just tried uh, in their way what, what they really enjoyed back then. And by, by accident, they came together with Argento. Yeah. And then that's it. You know, they did not compose the music for his, uh, some stuff, of course, later on. Right. But, I mean, the first stuff, he used what was already composed. Yeah, you know, so yeah. it was not composed for the films, but it's great music. It fits perfect to the films, and it, and and it made the film. It makes the films also a little bit more, um, um, especially back then. It must have made the films more uh, modern in a way. Yes. You no. Know? Oh yeah. It was not the not the classical uh, the classical composer who is doing a score. It was. Right. Uh, it was a rock band back then. Yeah. But don't forget, Profondo Rosso, for instance, I think Deep Red, is composed by, uh, an, by uh, a classical composer and played by Goblin. Don't forget. Yeah? Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, it's, not, all, it's all, not always Goblin. Uh, right. The, the, yeah. yeah. Uh, what's, what's his name? But anyway, um, Goblin is uh, it's, it's a, this is a very outstanding thing because it's a, a prog rock band uh, comes together with uh, with um, with a back then great uh, um, uh, great um, uh, director. Yeah? Yes, I have to load my phone. Yeah, <laughs> I know my my laptop's starting to run out of battery too right now. But um, but the first um, for Argento for those of you Dario Argento Italian director, you know from the from the seventies, um, his first. Uh, foray into the giallo, which what he was famous for, uh, was like Bird with the Crystal Plumage, Cat of Nine Tails, and um, Four Flies on Grey Velvet, this? right? Well, the first is Morricone. Yes, and the first three films were all Inyo Morricone film uh, a soundtrack, and but it was on it was on uh, Four Flies uh, on Grey Velvet that he had in, he was introducing a prog style band with the movie itself, which incorporated some of the prog stylings of the music inside there, which I, am, I right. which I assume in turn what he wanted to do for the rest of his movies after uh, Cat of Nine Tails and stuff. Four Flies. This is just uh, that with uh, this drama, no? He, yes. He falls in, into this case, no? Uh, yes. In a second, that's uh, more cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But this is early, late sixties, early seventies. Yes, no? very. So like the, the the goblin stuff comes like 75, 76. No? Yes, well, yeah, because it was because uh, it was deep red was the first introduction to goblin. Yeah, but there is the composer. Yes, the, com the composer is, is not. It's uh, what is his name? Um, yeah, I, it's slipping my mind right now. <laughs> Oh, anyway. Anyways, anyways. A great composer. Yes. But but what I like about a lot, like I was mentioning, like what I like about a lot of the Italian soundtracks is it's usually a band, right? It's usually like a jazz band, uh, a prog band, or something like that. But there's always like drummer, keyboard, guitar, bass, and... and they, and, and, they really had good musicians back then. Yes. They had good musicians. And all these orchestras, don't forget, all these orchestras also consisted of a bassist, drummer, Yep. Guitarist, yes. So 
And I think they, um, uh, when when some of the composers had their own orchestra, right. Right? always the same the same people. Uh, the smaller comp- composers didn't have that probably, so they had to go to a studio and and kind of rent the musicians there or, or ask if they have time for it, you know. Right. So uh, I guess we we always we hear more or less the same kind of people in the circulation. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Totally. So, but it was still, it was, there was many good musicians around and uh, affordable too. And uh, don't forget, they, they wrote the music on sheets. They gave it their notes to them and they played that, you know. Yeah. Some stuff, maybe it was also sessions too, yeah. And there's not everything was, uh, was done uh, on paper. Uh, some tracks sound like it, it could be a session. But still, if there's a composer behind, he tells them what to play. Right. Uh, this is great. Yeah. But yeah. it's all teach, you know, teach musicians. Um, you know, they learned the instrument from the beginning. You know, it's like and and they, and these these composers could go there and, and 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 search for new guys. You know, with just looking for a job. Great times. Yeah. Great no, times. honestly, it was and and the music just stood out. It. I mean, obviously, with movies themselves, usually fifty percent is visual and 50 percent is audio and with italian For stuff sure. and with italian stuff it's almost hard to gauge that because i mean a lot of them just their visuals themselves were like it was mind-blowing just the what what they were capturing on film but then in the, in the same right the music brought a lot of that visuals even more to the forefront like Absolutely. i mean i mean like uh, everybody always claims uh, suspiria to be the one movie where if the music wasn't there, the movie would not be there at all. I don't know about Suspiria, what was, if the music was done before or not, I don't know. It was done before. Know, instance, it was done before. Was done before? Yeah. So he was, he was, he was cutting it with, he was editing and cutting the, the movie with the music. Yes. Which is make, makes it much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the same goes, the same goes for, uh, for Sergio Leone. It's an old, old thing, you know, with the, with the Westerns. The yes. music was composed without the picture. I mean, so the genius in the end is Morricone, not Leone. Yeah. Because Morricone, he got that story told. Then he goes home on his desk writes the music, yeah. records it, gives it to him, and Leone shoots the movie with the music. So he knows exactly, you know, already, you know, where, where he could place it, and, and he gets the mood for it. Yes. And um, and that it makes it much easier, I think, for a, a director and for, for, for a set, for, for even for the actor. If you hear that music, that strong music, you move different, I'm very yeah. sure. Huh? Oh, yeah. So that makes it much, much easier. So the, the, the true genius, of course, Leone movies are... Uh, also great, of course, but the true genius is the composer in the, in, in the end, yeah? yes. because he envisioned it already in, in a musical approach, so strong. And, and imagine a Leone movie and switch off the sound. Yes. Switch it off. Then, then, then it's like, yeah, it's great pictures, but I mean, the this, this strong, the really strong impact is the music in the end. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, totally. Because I mean, yeah. like, even it's just establishing itself with just the credits at the beginning of the movie. And all of a sudden, that is the feel of the movie, is that music. It's just showing credits, no big deal or whatever. But once you get that music in there, right away, it's a completely different movie, different mood, everything. It, it sets the mood. Yep. It sets the mood from the beginning. And um, <clears throat> and uh, you, you can feel already, I can feel already a joy for the movie. Yeah. coming you know <laughs> without without knowing what is coming maybe or without without knowing if it's good but the music sets the level so high already yep. that you know I'm I'm already inside the story yes. somehow you know what I mean with the images and with the intro and with the names the actors whatever uh that that sets um yeah this and this this is the true magic and they were so capable of doing it and they were so good in doing it um I mean sure it was an industry after some years sure. yeah and um, what I understood is that, for instance, Marcona, I mean, he had an output which was so enormous. <clears throat> he had many collaborators. He had kind of an office, and they, yeah. they just gave him the notes, and they continued and stuff, you know, to make it quicker. Of, of course, it must have been like this, because otherwise uh, it, it would have been too much, you know, for in some years. The, the output is so enormous, you know. Yeah. You can't focus on a film properly uh, if you do 10 at the same time. You know? No, exactly. So, but it was an it was an industry also you don't know forget it was an industry yeah you know? it was like a, uh, also you could make good money and it was an industry and it had to be done quick there was deadlines and stuff you know 
Yeah. So, but still, it's it's, it's unbelievable. You know, if uh, I mean, sure, the budgets also were higher back then. Yeah, I guess because cinema and a lot of people went to cinema, so money was running. Sure. There was a lot of money involved. Yep. That that makes also things easier and quicker, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but on the outside, imagine uh, Morricone would have would be now thirty years, forty years, and he could he could work on uh, the technology from nowadays. Right. What, what would he would, what would he do now? Yeah. How honestly. Would he yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would like to hear it now. I'm a little bit old, but. Um, I would like to hear that. You know, well, but, he, uh, he he has he has been touring a little bit with some orchestra orchestrations and stuff like that. But again, uh, yeah, like is he actually actively making new material? I, I don't know. I I haven't really no, kept no, no, not at all. Right? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. The last thing is um, because I had an idea for the uh, docu- document documentary about composers but it was too difficult to to realize especially for me as a non-italian um but then when i had the, my first um, my first uh, uh, request for uh, composers um, right. i thought of course about i said if we, be, if we if we can get more on it we do it if not then we skip it right i said to myself yeah yeah <laughs> and we tried with him because he's the most important of course and of he's course and stuff. yeah and then i was told um he's at the moment he's, he's he's giving no no interview it was two years ago or three years ago he's giving no interviews because um a, a documentary about him and his life is is uh, now started ah. uh, with, uh, by by uh, a director called Tornatore, an Italian director. Okay. He, he, Mark Hall did, did many scores for him in the ah, 90s, wow. <clears throat> 80s and 90s. So they know each other. He okay. likes he likes uh, to be sure. together with people he worked. Uh, and and this Tornatore is doing a, 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 a full a featured film. About any more corner. Wow! And it should be released. Should be out soon. I, I think. I think they started two years ago or something. Wow! Okay. That's the reason why no interviews because he kept everything for this. Yeah, understandable. That's good. That's great. Understandable. You know, a, good, a, a great, yep. a great um, a feature film director is doing a, a. Who knows him personally? Who worked with him uh, on several films? Is doing a, a an homage and a documentary uh, at Lifetime, which is this is good. Right. You know? So this obvious, like, and so to wrap it all around, you started a record label because you love the soundtrack side of movie yeah. of the movies. So now, yes. I never, but I never wanted to do real soundtracks. I never wanted. I was never into releasing uh, uh, original soundtracks from okay. the sixties or seventies. This was not my. my this, there are so many labels around. It's already there's, done. There's no yeah. use. Yes, it's done. Even back then, it was done. Now yeah. it's overdone. <laughs> yes, but. Um, uh, for me, important was to give uh, a platform to uh, artists which uh, have this in common, and uh, I was surprised how many right. uh, have it in common. Yes, you know? yeah. I, di- I didn't expect it, you know. And in the beginning, I I, I named myself differently. I didn't want to have any um, connection to the metal scene at all, you know, because I thought, you know, I don't want to have to be this this. I don't, I don't want it that people say, ah, this metal guy is doing now. Um, uh, strange uh, soundtrack-ish uh, bands. You know, I didn't want to have this connection in the beginning, you know, right. because I thought this this has to develop by itself, its and own, not by yeah. my name. Right. You know, I don't want that 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 leads in the wrong direction. You know, yeah. of course, uh, I did not succeed hiding myself too much. So, <laughs> uh, but in the beginning, I tried because I really didn't want to 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 make it look like. Uh, and a male guy is not doing uh, this kind of label. You know, right. I wanted to to to. I tried to 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 um, set it up in without any. You know, uh, you know, you always have ah uh, uh, oh, this guy is doing that. Then you you judge already before you hear or see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. This, I didn't want to have it's because I think there's there's no connection. It's just me as a persona, but there's no connection. Um, you know, there's nothing. I, I I was not acting in a movie, and I'm not a director. I have nothing. You know, this this is only because I have a, a past um, uh, with a metal band. Um, right. I don't see the connection. Right. Yeah. I realized later on that many metal people, or metal um, uh, followers, are also interested in movies, of course, and in soundtracks. I realized later. On but it's also a big hype 
Yes. Yeah? It wasn't. Understandable. It wasn't uh, eight, nine, ten years ago. It wasn't. Yeah, no. I don't think so. Nobody uh, cared. Yeah, no, no, it is. Yeah, nobody was big on just soundtracks and everything like that. Uh, I mean, everybody liked the you know movies and everything in the background, but the soundtracks, like you said, uh, didn't really blow up until the last like four or five years, and all of a sudden it was cool to like you know yeah. Goblin and Inyo Morricone and all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So understandable. I, I there. saw Morricone in the nineties already. Yeah, I saw him live in the nineties. Uh, went to Italy. I even played in Austria in the first time. Um, I, I went to Italy and, and I saw um, uh, Goblin and uh, I met Stelvio Cipriani before he died. I wow. interviewed him for a long time and wow. stuff. So I, this, I, had, I had no, and, and I had, you know, I always felt um, uh, I have to do that for myself and for, uh, for um, you know, to, 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 <laughs> to uh, I, I can't explain to, uh, to fulfill my vision, yep. you know, no, and, totally. and, to, and to help people which are very, very uh, similar in their way of thinking and, and doing great music too. Uh, and they're not searching for a movie particularly, of course, if somebody comes up and says, this is the soundtrack I'm looking for, I'm, I'm sure they will work with them. But um, they envision their own uh, movie in their heads when yeah. they wrote their music. Literally. And, um, and that's what you're doing. There's no label around. Yeah, and that's what you're doing. And it's... It, it, and it's it's it doesn't get that appreciated than uh, than a real score. Right. I have to say that too. You know, uh, people need pictures and they need big names. You know. Sure. And of course, if you give me a, a fucking John Carpenter soundtrack or a Fabio Fritti soundtrack of a Fuji movie only, yeah. if you give me this, I can sell also many copies. I sure. do a proper release, really nice looking, and everything fine. I will sell. No problem. There's no problem to sell that. You know. Right. It's very difficult to sell stuff which people don't know. Yes. You know what I mean? And if there's no movie behind, it's even more difficult, you know? Right. So, uh, and, and I did not want in the beginning that it's connected to a metal guy. So, you know, and then it, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was not so difficult for me because uh, my products were really good. I mean, not only good looking, only the people who uh, were back then interested in that kind of music uh, immediately could hear the beauty of the music. Yeah? Right. So I had my, I have, I, I gained my audience, but now, I mean, I see now what is going on nowadays with all these um, uh, soundtrack releases. It's, uh, it's totally over the top and crazy. Yeah, and yeah. it's too much, too, yep. to be honest. Ah, uh, understand. Too pricey. Yes. Too pricey. Very pricey. Yeah, I ended up, uh, I ended up buying the uh, the Zombie Holocaust re-release, the double vinyl yeah. or whatever, and that cost me, I think, sixty three bucks, sixty three dollars, right? But it's the only thing available, though. That's the problem, right? I mean, like, there's the original. Yeah. The original presses are out there, but they're just hard to find now. I don't. I don't even recall if it ever was released on vinyl before. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I, I have this. I have this idea of Zombie Holocaust, and this was released like ninety, ninety five, ninety six, because I, I, I sold it myself. I, I deal with it myself um, when I was working in that record store and it was a German label who released it first oh. Lucetola Media and the same guy is doing he's now my authoring guy for my blurries so ah. funny but he, he had a, a CD label in the 90s and he released not many but between 10 and 15 right. Cannibal Holocaust released this was a very important release and he released uh, Cipriani for the for the somber movie of Lenzi what is his name the English name Contamination no, con oh yeah, alien contamination, uh, contamination, uh, toxic spawn was the uh, uh, yeah probably that, with the, Ian McCullough, right? Is yeah. that the one you're talking about? No, 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 the other one. From, uh, the English titles, I'm not so familiar with the English titles, almost the German and Italian titles. Um, in Kubu. Uh, oh, uh, city of the Li city of the Walking Dead. It's the only. It's the only the only uh, zombie movie of Lenzi. Yes, Lenzi. Nightmare City. Nightmare City, that's it. That's that's it. it. He released Nightmare City yeah. uh, first time on CD. He released um, uh, and, and Zombie Holocaust. He released Dr. Butcher MD, right? Well, yeah. Zombie Holocaust, yep. first time on CD in the 90s. And this was a great label. And I think it was never released before or after on vinyl. Wow. And okay. I, I, never, I never saw the release you had. Um, yeah. I'm, I stopped uh, supporting this. It's, I don't want to buy... I don't want to buy... You know, uh, how many more times do I have to buy a, a soundtrack? Right. I have it already maybe two times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. Of 
course, later on, uh, I bought an expanded version, you know, with 10 bonus tracks. Yeah, yeah. You know, and now to invest another 60 whatever dollars or euros for an LP. Uh, yeah. So now we have Cineploit, uh, and they, you've been putting yeah. out cool, original sound uh fake soundtracks and uh and just homages homages yes and uh and you're having fun with this so um yeah if you want to like i said the fans out there cineploit so c-i-n-e-p-l-o-i-t so cineploit.com uh to go check out everything he's got the band camp he's got youtube uh buy the vinyl and you're working with um uh steel steel books also too correct no no what no, are those what are those on there then uh, media books media called. books okay media books right gotcha so i started um three four years ago with films too okay right on well it's because i mean like it just goes hand in hand if you love the soundtrack you're obviously knee deep in the the movie side of it all too because i mean the movie first and then the soundtrack you figure out afterwards uh, but that's awesome that you have this label and i would say it's niche but it's it's passion over anything really yeah absolutely i mean you have you must have passion somehow to do this you know to do this yeah, exactly especially this niche yeah. of, a, of, of, of a of a genre right i mean you know i, I I love my Italian crime jazz. I love, you know, the old European stuff and everything like that. But to find a label that's specifically trying to bring that feel back and 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 everything is I I commend you for that actually. It's fucking it's pretty it's pretty rad, man. All movies are released so far uh, are, are movies which were not uh, released in a digital way worldwide. Right. So all of them are first time uh, available digital and in, in 2K and on Blu-ray. Wow. So uh, I uh, all restored and um, I, I produce featurettes and interviews of people which are alive um, uh, as, as extra. Um, in some cases, I, I did a documentary about an, an, act, an Austrian actor. Um, he was a big exploitation star, um, but he died too early. So I did an, a documentary about his life and, 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 and work. <clears throat> for one release yeah some releases have this they have the full score also on the blu-ray wow cool it's not separate it's not a, not a separate cd right uh, you know you have to pay extra it's not it's not necessary you know right but if it's a, if, if, if it's possible if there's a beautiful score you know I, I i put it on the on the disc yeah um yeah i released so far six films and uh two are um are now at the pressing plant very soon right on the next two and uh, mostly of them, uh, police crime movies. Uh, there's one one uh, drug drama, late seventies drug drama from Rome, and one um, how do you say, kind of a revenge movie in the mercenary, mercenary soldier field. Right. With Paul Svensson. Um, yeah. The next Sweet. will be uh, the next two. One will be an an sixties uh, gangster movie. <clears throat> And I don't, I can't say any name. It's a surprise. You yeah, know, I have to yeah. keep it. One will be a sixties um, gangster movie, and and, and uh, the other will be uh, a seventies police movie. Cool, again. cool, right on. So you're keeping busy and uh, just just trying to bring, just trying to bring this to a new audience. We have a new generation of fans of you know the old cinema and uh, European cinema and everything like that. So that's cool that you're trying to bring these these rarities and these gems back to life with like a new like you said like a blu-ray new uh with the, the clean soundtracks and, and a media book to tell the whole story pretty much the whole background yeah, of it yeah. all, right a lot of picture material there's a lot to read it's in german and in english it's always english friendly it's it's region free it's um english language italian language german language it got subtitles english and uh, wow. uh german so you wow. have uh, all options there, yeah. Wow. And, um, <laughs> Very and cool. funny enough, uh, just not long ago, I think uh, one month ago, two months ago, I get an order from a guy, uh, Scott, something, and I thought I know this name, and he ordered uh, two or three movies. Um, but I remember this name. This, and then it was the repulsion guy. 
Scott Carlson. It was totally crazy. And he did not know it. it's me writing this level. <laughs> yeah, Scott Carlson. Yes, Scott Carlson, yeah. who works for Rise Above. I didn't even know he's working for Rise Above in America. I didn't even know. And uh, I know this name from, from some somewhere, you know. Yeah, he's a huge yeah. horror fan. You could tell he's a big he's a big movie buff. Uh, just just I from... was not I, I wasn't in touch. I wasn't connected with him. Right. You know? I, I'm now, but I wasn't connected. I did not realize he's a film fan. I did not realize he's working for Real Life Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Last time I met him was in in 2004 or five maybe. We played together the festival in Spain. Oh wow! I never saw him again. Uh, and and lost lost in touch and 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 did not search for him also. So uh, he was not he was never never a friend, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I like like his music and everything, but uh, he I was never um, connected with him. But then uh, suddenly get, uh, get a, getting an order from him for these movies, and and that was great, you know. Right on, yeah. right on. So um, we had, I want to wrap this up here. We're getting. Uh... I'm sorry, my batteries are starting to run a little low too myself. Um, I'm 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 uh, connected. I'm I'm power. Okay, <laughs> but um, uh, so like you said, you have some new releases coming out with Cineploit. Um, yes, and music uh, releases too. Yes, also music releases. One of my own, and uh, and the Suspecto guy is doing a side project. Sweet. And uh, with Pungent Stench, uh, you helped get the old albums re-released through, what was it, Plastic Head? Plastic Head, and I think the label is called Dissonance Records. Dissonance, I think, is the, the, the label of, the, of, 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 of these Plastic Head guys. And, uh, yeah, uh, two years ago uh, or three years ago, uh, I finalized a deal with them for all, all albums, including the unreleased ones. And uh, two years ago, all the old stuff uh, was released, and last year... The unreleased one was released, and the unreleased Mentos um, project was released too. So CD, vinyl, I, CD also, and CD I put uh, and LP of course. And CD I, I, I was going through my cassettes <laughs> uh, because um, you know back in the early days, especially, I always said to the sound guy, uh, "Here's a cassette, you know, record our live set." Yeah, and I kept these tapes, of course, and. Um, some are pretty okay sounding, you know. So uh, yeah. I, I went through all these tapes, and uh, uh, you know, I put, I, I made, I put. Oh, also, these are totally full seventy, whatever, seventy-five, eighty minutes of music right. with um, soundboard recordings of uh, of that particular year. The record is sweet. coming from. Sweet, sweet. Uh, Ed, do we have any last words before we uh, before we wrap this up here, my friend? From my side, yes. Uh, what can I say? Uh, it's great that, that um, how we come together, how, how, how you found me and I found you now. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot in, we have a lot in common. Oh, yeah. I, I, can, I can, <laughs> can see and, and read. Uh, it's great. And I look forward to your documentary. I will uh, uh, do a proper interview for you. Yes. You have to send me questions. Yeah? I will you got it. sort something out. Yeah, I, I got my guy. My guy is very, my friend is very interested. He will film it 4K for you. Excellent, it's a super camera. So you get you get uh, cinema quality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have the best and, looking uh, interview on the documentary then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I look forward to this. It's good. It's a, it's, a, it's a good idea to do and a good project of you guys. Um, I have to check uh, what what what's done already. Uh, sure, it's, it's all brand new. We just uh, came in touch last week. I think. Oh, you got it. Yep. But it's, it is a good project. Uh, I thought myself, you know, that um, this kind of history should have should should, should be told uh, in a better way, or should be should be told some someday, you know. Right. Because there were so many connections and so many, and and everybody knew everybody. It was a little family kind of, you know, yes. almost. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and I guess I guess there's still some people around from these days. Oh yeah. And um, and we're doing it yeah, properly. I think it, Hmm? We're doing it properly. Yeah, you have to. If you do something, then you have to do it properly. I mean, <laughs> every, everything else would be a waste of time. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you very much, Alex, man. It's been thank an you. absolute pleasure, and I hope everybody out there caught some of the cool stories. And like I said, we upload everything afterwards, so nothing's lost. And... Uh, well, then uh, we're going to keep talking in the background because uh, we have a few things in store also that uh, we need to chat about more still. So uh, that and, 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 and that's what I love about, you know, 
everybody complains. You know, social media, you know, is unfortunately sucking right now because everyone's talking too much about politics or whatever. But if you look beyond that, and there's still a good networking base that I mean, during yeah, all this, course, yeah. during during all this you shit, have to use it. yeah, you have to use it properly. You have to use it for your own way. Yes. Um, I I was um um I, I was very bad in the social media thing uh, when I started my label. I had nothing, yeah, uh, almost uh, just Facebook, nothing else. Yeah. Because I hated it more or less. But yeah. I I realized, you know, I have to do it, you know, because. <laughs> Otherwise, I will not reach nothing, you know. Yep. I will go nowhere with my releases and stuff. So, you know, I always said I use social media for my business more or less, you yes. know. And I don't want to connect with people I don't know. I, I don't care, you know. Yep. But but I want to, you know, put my stuff out and out and that's what. And still, I, I have many artists. So, special guy, he hates it. He does not have anything. He doesn't use nothing in social media. Sultan, they hate it. Nothing. They're not. You can't reach them. You yeah. can't reach these guys. They're just out. It is great, too. That's but it does not help, of course. Of course. <laughs> it does not help me, and, and um, it does not help the releases of them. You know? Right. It does, it, it does harm them almost. Yeah? But I understand them. You know, I can't force them, so yeah. I do it for them. But, you know, it could be better if the, if the band works with you. You know, it of could course. be much easier. Yep. But they hate it so much that they really reject it, and they don't, they don't do it. <laughs> so, so you have to step up to the plate. <laughs> yes, and I will. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you no, very. But it's, it's it's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, thank sir. Very and much. Uh, yeah, like I said, we're gonna chat very soon. And uh, yeah, make sure to check out uh, Cineploit releases if you're into the uh, soundtracks and everything like that. And like you mentioned, uh, all the pungent, all the old pungent, and everything like that's been re-released. Vinyl, CDs, bonus, live tracks, all kinds of jazz, man. So let's just keep supporting. And uh, thank you very much, my man. Thank you. Take good care. Cool, bud. Take it easy. Ciao. Ciao. All right. Killer. There we are. There we are. Bam. <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, hey, sorry about the beginning there. I had a little, uh, like I said, uh, trying. Is he still going in the background there? No. No, he's not in the background there. Uh, here. And again, if you're not, if you're not a fan of Matt Carr, Putrid Matt, this guy, I don't know if I can tell if he's in the background. No, I don't think he's not going anywhere. Is he though? That's funny. Ah, how about we just do this? There we go. There we go. Um, so, hey man, I appreciate uh, you hanging out. And like I said, man, I'm sorry at the beginning if it was a little... Uh, if it was a little off balance, the 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 everything like that there, uh, we, I had all my stuff torn down, and like I said, we were shooting short movies, so everything was out out of place. But uh, eh, first half an hour, a little blown out. But I mean, as long as you can hear Alex and his stories, man, that's that's kind of what uh, that's what we're here for, right? So uh, I think we have an interview for Thursday. Uh, I'm not going to confirm it, but. It's pretty damn close, and I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy what we have in store for you. So uh, thank you for coming back. I'm glad to be back. Nice to sit down, chat about the death metal and all that jazz and horror movies. I mean, he, Alex is a massive horror fan. So, we, yeah, once you connect with, with someone like-minded like that, it, it topics just go and go and go. But, uh, hey, thank you very much. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Support everything. Support. Uh, where? Where was it here? Ugh, ugh, oh yeah, support Deathrus. Fucking a. All right. Keep it rocking, people. Keep it rocking.